sure their electronic devices are switched to mute, Pat. Well. <laughs> when they aren't speaking in order to ensure quality of sound recording. Uh, if you're content, we could go through the agenda as follows. Uh, no apologies. Uh, remind members that they're obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interest at each committee meeting as applicable. I'll be making one declaration uh, when Sam McBride comes in and speaks because I've had uh, uh, discussions with him and meetings with him before, particularly on the issues of RHI, so it wouldn't be appropriate if I was deemed to be asking him questions on this particular issue. Um, if we move on to the next item, the draft minutes procedure of the 20th of May 2020. Four members of the draft minutes of the meeting on the 20th of 2020 are at page 5. Members, are we content that the draft minutes are accurate and records of proceedings? Right. Take that as an agreement, and we're agreed for the published on the website. Right. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, moving on to matters arising, dilapidation payments. I remind members at the meeting on the 22nd of May, it was agreed to seek research from RAISE regarding outstanding dilapidation payments. I draw members' attention to a response from the RAISE table at page three. Paul, do you want to say anything? Page three, is that in table papers? Uh, table, yeah, table at page three. Right, I haven't got them up yet, Chair. Uh, uh, our members would like to comment while I... Yep. I don't think I would like some more additional information. I think, bearing in mind what we were thinking of in the committee and the tone of the conversation we were having last week, I'd like to get some more information on it. I think I would like your agreement to ask Reyes to request additional information from the Department in order to proceed with the research, because I don't think that is sufficiently detailed for us to come to our conclusion. Agreed? Yep. Agreed. Okay. Uh, next item was, uh, and thank you all very much indeed for being around for the uh, various degrees of the Budget Bill yesterday. And there were some comments that the Minister made in his winding up. I would like members in his winding up on yesterday's debate on the vote of account on the Budget No. 2 Bill. The Minister raised a number of points which would be worth the Committee considering further. And I think the Minister would be quite happy for us to look at these as well, because that's what he uh, alluded to. Uh, particularly around the uh, around targeted rate support, managed overcommitments of financial uh, allocations, further borrowing, financial transactions capital, procurement, remote flexible working, financial scrutiny by committees, and also uh, the fiscal council. Uh, if you are in agreement, I'd like to consider a, uh, to consider a clerk's paper at next week's meeting, outlining the issues in more detail and providing some more analysis. Are we content? Yeah. Yep. Uh, just when we're talking about, and I think we'll re it might come up later on, but one of the issues I think was raised particularly by the minister yesterday and also by other members from the floor, I think, Paul, I think you raised it as well, uh, the issue between the Justice Committee and the Justice Minister. Um, and I think our minister was being, has been quite open with us in providing the financial details and information that's come through to this committee. And I think I was quite surprised to discover the fact that the Justice Committee were relying on our committee to get the necessary information they were getting out of the committee. I think, um, and bearing in mind, the Finance Minister made it clear that he's fully open for openness and transparency. I would like to just put on record that we as a Finance Committee take our position very seriously, and we will make sure all the committees are kept fully informed of the financial position as we see it coming through, if you're content with that. Chair, my, my fear is that there are committees, through no fault of their own, missing things because there are unknown unknowns. Yeah. Uh, and that's the real worry for me. We only really picked this up in the Justice Committee because of the work, because of the RIA's paper, because of the yeah. conformity, and then because of conformity, and because then we were able to pass the information on too. And we were able to look at it in two angles. And that's how we missed or we, we found the discrepancies. But there'll be committees there who, because it's an unknown, it's very hard to ask for an unknown. So, so it's, it, it, there could be things out there that's being missed only because we picked this up because of the work that this committee has done. So I'm really worried and concerned about this going forward for all committees and, and the scrutiny of this place. Okay. Any other comments? Could I just make a comment? Um, in considering my bill, I've been looking at other amendments. And one of the things I've been thinking of is 
Whereas under Section 44 of the, of the 98 Act, we have the right to compel and command papers, there's nowhere in the legislation which puts a statutory duty on departments without us going that far to supply material. Now, I was thinking of flipping, putting a statutory duty on departments to furnish committees with all they need for committee work. Hmm. That's something that, in my mind, which I think would address in part the issue. I'd be happy enough to consider that and look at that going okay. forward, absolutely. Okay. Content to move on. Uh, next uh, item is the oral evidence from the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission on the functioning of government miscellaneous provisions bill. And I'd like to welcome in. I declare my interest. <laughs> I think we got that. Les was out there a minute ago. Yeah, there, there. Les, come on on in. Yep. Please. Great. David, come in. My phone, sorry, I should have done this before. Thought it would go off. So. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, members, I would like to remind you that the agenda item is being recorded by Hansard. I'd like to draw your attention to the following papers related to this agenda item the clerk's briefing paper on page 12. Uh, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission submission paper, page 16. And, sorry, Les, if you don't mind me calling you Les, uh, yes. please, uh, I'm delighted if you would make an opening statement. <coughs> Chair, thank you. <coughs> um, thank you for the invitation, and um, I'll just make some brief opening remarks. Um, first of all, the Commission welcomes the Bill's purpose um, of increasing accountability and transparency of the role of special advisers. Um, in particular, though it clearly extends beyond special advisers, um, at the outset there's no human rights impediment to placing safeguards on a statutory footing, per se, as opposed to creating arrangements within, for example, a code of conduct. <clears throat> Given the backdrop to this bill, um, I accept there are substantial arguments in favour of doing this within a statutory framework, um, and I recognise the bill goes further than the recommendations of the RHI inquiry, and again, there's no human rights constraints in principle for, for doing so. Um, the Commission, I don't think, has um, a particular view on the merits or otherwise of the individual clauses um, which do not give rise to human rights considerations save in um, the respects that I just want to cover briefly. Um, the first is the bill creates two separate criminal offences, Clause 9, which is the offence for a minister, civil servant or a special advisor when communicating on government business by electronic means, use personal accounts or anything other than department, departmental systems by email addresses, um, acknowledge that there is a defence of a reasonable excuse for failure to do so, but it can result in a term of imprisonment of up to two years on conviction by way of indictment and six months or a fine or both on uh, conviction on a summary basis. The second is Clause 11, <coughs> which again, without prejudice to the Official Secrets Act, any minister, special advisor or civil servant who communicates directly or indirectly confidential and or commercially sensitive information to any natural person or legal entity for the financial or other potential benefit of any natural person, legal entity, minister, special <coughs> advisor or civil servant, again commits a criminal offence uh, if successfully prosecuted and will face up to five years uh, imprisonment on indictment and up to six months or a fine on summary conviction. The reason I've read the offence um, which I know you committee will be very familiar with, is because it's so widely drawn, it appears to cover everything, for example, from speaking to a journalist at one end of a spectrum um, and inadvertently or otherwise letting something slip through to effectively corrupt insider tra trading for personal gain at the other end of, of the spectrum. 
And there are three issues in human rights terms. <clears throat> the first is creating such a criminal offence must be proportionate both in terms of the offences themselves and in terms of the breadth of the offence. Uh, the Human Rights Council, for example, has suggested that a criminal offence um, must demonstrate its necessity and only take such measures as are proportionate to the pursuance of legitimate aims in order to ensure continuous and effective protection of convention rights. And in similar vein, the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights in a general comment has said something very similar, uh, and again I'm quoting here, namely that states must demonstrate the necessity of criminal offences and only take such measures that are proportionate to the pursuance of legitimate aims in order to ensure continuous and effective protection of covenant rights, including the right to liberty. So proportionality is one of our concerns. The second is, um, in practical terms, if the leaking of any information by a civil servant, a special political advisor, or a minister could lead to criminal prosecution, you immediately entangle any disciplinary proceedings with the scepter of criminal action. Um, and the possibility of criminal action in, in the Commission's view may bring the disciplinary process into Article 6 and the right to a fair trial, and no doubt with arguments about halting any disciplinary proceedings until it's clear whether there will be a criminal investigation <clears throat> and or a prosecution at its conclusion. And um, I think, therefore, without the criminal offences, there's a strong argument to say that Article 6 uh, guarantees do not apply. And I think we will um, need to be mindful of how then disciplinary proceedings will manage if they are intertwined with potential criminal offences. And the third concern that we have is that there's the question of Article 10 of the Convention, that's the right to freedom of expression. It's not an absolute right, and any curbs must be prescribed in law, and Jim Allister's bill clearly does that. It must be necessary in a democratic society, um, which is obviously a matter of, of uh, uh, debate, and it can be in certain circumstances, and that includes the prevention of disclosure of information received in confidence, protecting the reputation and the rights of others. But our concern here again speaks to the breadth of the clause, um, but also it does not provide um, protection for whistleblowers. Um, I've no doubt it may be used as a defence if there was ever a prosecution, but I think my concern and the concern of the Commission is it's likely to inhibit genuine whistleblowing of a civil servant, for example, um, the Public Interest Disclosure Act ensures that everyone who is dismissed for whistleblowing can be considered unfairly dismissed, but it seems to us that it's one thing to risk your job by whistleblowing, quite another to risk your liberty. I think I'll stop at that point and then happy to take any questions. Jim? Yeah, um, <coughs> thank you very much. Um, could I just um, make one general point and then deal with some topics sure. with you. Any assembly registration, of course, is human rights right proofed by the fact that it can't get to royal assent unless the Attorney General filters it through as human rights compliant. Isn't that right? Yes, yes, yes. under the Northern Ireland Act, yeah. Yep. In terms of, I'll come to Clause 11 in a moment because I think you've made some important points. But in respect of Clause 9, you tell us in your written submission that I think the preference would be for that to be articulated within codes. Would you agree with me that the experience of codes, which did require confidentiality, which did require probity, which did require honesty, has been a very disappointing one in terms of RHI? They proved to be inadequate, to put it as neutral as I can. Uh, hence, do you not think that against that background of the failure of codes, there could be advantage in being, having, the, having the 
clarity and emphaticness of legislation. Yeah, <clears throat> I'd, I'd separate out two issues. Whether it's necessary to create criminal offences within this bill, from what I see as a separate issue, which is whether um, facing some of the issues that, um, in terms of accountability, into statutory framework as opposed to a code of conduct. You won't find me looking to disagree with you that given the history of this and given that we've attempted to do this by way of codes of conduct in the past, and given what we now know in the RHI inquiry, that that has palpably failed in the past. And therefore, there is, it seems to me, a compelling argument to say that putting this into a statutory framework doesn't create any undue human rights issues, in, in my view, and that's a matter of judgment, and I can see perfectly strong, valid arguments for doing that, given, given where we are. On the other hand, creating criminal offences, as opposed to statutory discipline, you know, or, or placing the uh, disciplinary procedures on a much stronger statutory framework, I think moves you into different territory. And therefore, that moves you into the issue of proportionality. Um, I think Clause 11, in particular, is, is, is problematic. Um, uh, if you are going to create the criminal offences, then they must be proportionate. There's a set of issues in terms of public interest disclosure. But there's also, I suppose, a debate to be had about the role of special political advisers. And on the one hand, um, what has happened in the past and how the, the latitude that has been taken, if you like, uh, in terms of special political advisers against neutering <coughs> special political advisers to the extent that they can't be Understand. the political antennae of a minister. Yeah. For well, I, I want to come specifically in a moment to Clause 11, but just on the, the issue of Clause 9 and whether codes are adequate to deal with the abuse of private emails, etc., We've had evidence from various quarters in written form and oral. Amongst the written evidence we had was from Sam McBride, who wrote the book Burned, which I suspect you might have read. I have. <laughs> and um, something of an authority in these matters, it might be thought. In his written evidence, he said this. I believe that central to the flaws of the Stormont system, which enabled disasters, such as RHI, was secrecy. By allowing spas to keep their work off the government system, at least in part to evade FOI, there was no accountability and an inherent danger of dark practices up to the level of corruption. If it is recognised that using private phones and email addresses, thus hiding things from official record, is dangerous, then there needs to be some tough sanction for those who do so. Do you agree with that? Um, yes, in part. Um, and I'm kind of nuancing what I. In, the difficulty I think the Commission has with Clause 9 is um, while there is the defence of a reasonable excuse, it is still widely drawn. And um, you characterised, for example, a kind of a want, almost a wanton abuse of. Um, the use of um, non-departmental um, phones, etc., emails, um, for a malign purpose, um, and depending on what that malign purpose is, there might be circumstances where it would be reasonable to look at an offence. But I think in terms of how this is drawn, which seems to currently as drawn suggest that any use could potentially be a criminal offence, um, whether that's inadvertent, whether that's of a relative innocent um, purpose. Um, I understand that often the purpose of criminal legislation is twofold. One is to have a deterrent effect, yeah. and the other is obviously to have a prosecutorial effect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the deterrent effect should be a deterrence against clear, deliberate abuse rather than a kind of wider blanket to stifle but, but sure the antidote ordinary to that activity. Is the reasonable excuse defence 
which means that if someone can demonstrate that what they did was reasonable, then there's no risk of conviction. Is that not the safety net there? <clears throat> I think in the deterrent effect is that if somebody, and maybe what it's designed to do, uh, says, well, I will never use anything other than departmental communication, um, uh, uh, but if somebody rings you on your own phone outside of, you know, your, or emails you in some other way for a purpose that isn't malign, um, and that potentially creates an offence. I guess the question for us is, is that proportionate to... Well, I can tell you, obviously, in taking evidence and discussing this, my thinking is refining, and I am minded to have an amendment which would... Um, deal with that situation by simply putting a responsibility then to record within the official systems the fact that such an event took place, if you follow me. Yeah. yeah. On, clause na on clause 11, likewise... Uh, Sorry, just one just second, just for a, a point of clarification. As, um, does your organisation tolerate any movement of official documentation or official emails outside official communications number. We probably need to look to David in terms of um, whether we have a policy in place. We, wouldn't, we certainly don't expect... Well, uh, we would expect you would have a policy, yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah, all, the, all the documents go via the Commission's yeah. emails. Yeah. All official documentation. Uh, and the reason for that? It is obviously to protect protect information that may well be confidential and would not be appropriate to go into the public domain. You acknowledge that was not what was happening in some departments? Well, it, it's clear from the RHI inquiry um, that that See, absolutely wasn't happening, yeah. If you leave it within codes and then it becomes just a disciplinary matter, the new code <coughs> of conduct for special advisors where is the Article 6 compliance in the process when it simply says the minister shall have responsibility for discipline? Yeah, well, uh, I think one of the issues we have is, is clearly the bill is aimed at more than special political advisers. Yes. It's aimed at the civil service yes. um, as well as ministers. Um, um, the question, I think, for this committee is should that be dealt with by way of a proper and effective disciplinary process, and how do you do that, including can you put some statutory framework around that against should you create criminal offences? I think in human rights terms you can create criminal offences, yes. but they must be proportionate. And yes. the question I think we have is whether the bill as drafted now is creating proportionate criminal offences. I've got that, but I was asking you a different question. If you stick with code, and we know what the new code says, and it says you shall not use unofficial devices, etc., and if that is breached, it becomes then a matter of discipline. But where within that process, because there is no process, is Article 6 met? Well, <clears throat> the Article 6 protections, in my view, come, yeah, I don't think there are, I don't think it would be covered as simply a disciplinary offence where let's assume that the ultimate sanction is you could lose your job as a result of it. Yes. My, uh, I think, you know, covered in this letter, but my analysis of Article 6 is it probably doesn't provide, it probably doesn't fall within Article 6, the right to a fair trial, based on the case law as I understand it. I think it probably would move into Article 6 protection if the issue is not just you may face a disciplinary um, outcome, but you also may face a uh, criminal sanction and imprisonment, then, I, but, then you certainly you move into the right to a fair trial in, in terms of You criminal. could lose your job. You could lose your job. Uh, let's look at what the new code says. The responsibility for the management and conduct of special advisors, including discipline, rests with the minister who made the appointment. End of. No process of how the discipline is organised. 
nothing that shows compatibility with Article 6. Now, have you as a Commission drawn the Minister's attention, the Department's attention, to that obvious flaw in their code that if they're going to indulge in discipline, then it needs to be Article 6 compliant if it could involve the loss of the employment? <coughs> what I'm saying is I'm not sure that it does fall within Article 6 if, if, if the issue is simply a disciplinary process where you could lose your job. There's, a, there's an, um, an argument. But what I think I'm saying is that you could, for example, place statutory duties on a minister to... You, know, you could put some additional bulwark to this in a statutory framework. Um, that wouldn't create a human rights problem in my view. Um, so doing, having a statutory framework for dealing with this does not create an impediment from the Human Rights Commission's perspective you know, to doing so. There's no, the issue for us, and it's, it's kind of where I, so if, if the Assembly is minded to put a statutory framework around some of the requirements of a special political advisor and a civil servant, etc., um, providing they're proportionate in human rights terms, it can do so. If you're going to create criminal offences within that, then I think you really are looking at issues of proportionality uh, in terms of... I understand outcome. that. The point I was simply making to you was that if it stays in the code, and it's the code as is, and therefore it goes simply to ministerial discipline of the SPAD, that SPAD has no human rights protections within the code as drafted. Yeah. Mm. I don't know whether it would help or not to, to ask, but um, in terms of due process for a disciplinary process, one would assume at the minute that special advisors can appeal in the same way as any employee, or to the extent that it is, and that might be a question you might want to ask in terms of the LRA or Employment Appeals Tribunal, for a discipline that amounted to unfair dismissal, Presumably, as with any employee, that would, be the, that would be the process by which you would mount an appeal. You'd expect that before you get there, you would. some and I think that's human rights enough. compliance. You would expect the point I'm making to you is the code is absent of human rights compliance for the SPAD who's disciplined by his minister. And I would have thought assuming you'd be drawing that, that to the attention of the Assuming department. that you're correct, that there is no process. There is none. Um, well, assume, let's take that for the pur this purpose. Clause 11, I, I appreciate I'm hogging a bit of the time. But just uh, one second, Jim. Just to, sir, just to go back to what you were saying about sort of, you know, there's a compelling argument, as you said yourself, that this could be put into a legislative framework. The issue that you have is not that. The issue is the proportionality issue. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the issue of whether you put it in a statutory framework or otherwise is not a, a human rights um, there's not a set of human rights issues there. You, if you decide to do it by code of conduct, and if the code of conduct, putting aside for a second, if it was adequate and effective, could be perfectly human rights compliant. Mm. If you decided instead, bearing in mind what's happened here, that you were going to place it in a, within a, statute, a, a more <clears throat> firm set of statutory safeguards, in our view, that potentially would be equally human rights compliant. So there is not a kind of compelling argument that says human rights determines it must be in a code of conduct as opposed to a creature of statute. Well, it's the issue, the issue that you have is on the issue on proportionality, and particularly the role of the criminal offences. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jim? Uh, Jerry, can you just indulge me one moment? Uh, just on Clause 11, I take your points about the um, whistleblower, so I am minded to move an amendment which will make provision of that, um, probably in tandem with introducing the reasonable excuse defence, yep. and part of that being that the disclosure was made in the public interest. Now, if it had the reasonable excuse defence and the provision, uh, the defence that it was made in the public interest, that would meet your points, wouldn't it? I think it would. I think, <clears throat> I think our other recommendation was that um, in the wording, I think, in, in line 20 of your bill about benefit <coughs> would be to add the word improper benefit. In other words... Yes, well, I'm, I'm open um, to that. And, and again, to be clear, the Commission is not saying you cannot have a criminal offence uh, in terms of um, 
seeking an improper benefit, for example, in terms of your behaviour, um, as I'd said earlier, the spectrum of the continuum. If, if somebody used their knowledge and breached a confidence <coughs> for a kind of almost insider trading mm. in order to benefit themselves commercially, etc., would that be a reasonable grounds to create a criminal offence? I think very arguably it would. Um, I think you'd have to severely focus um, quite forensically Clause 11 in terms of it to make sure it is proportionate. Um, and you suggested some of the ways, with, without looking at the exact rewording of it, it's um, not going to be possible to make a kind of definitive kind of um, approach, but I think it would be a much safer in. ground. That's the territory we're in. Yes, I'm yeah. so I, I, accept that, I accept that entirely. No. I, I'm, I'm saying, but it's not a. There's a policy argument about whether creating yep. criminal offences well, at all, that. which which you may decide that actually, in policy terms, that's not a good thing to do. Yep. But if you have a narrowly um, focused clause, that may well be human rights compliant. It really depends on what the clause says. Um, and then there's the wider debate about whether it's a good thing to do that. Mm. Um, mm. Well, we're at the point where the Assembly has approved the principles of the bill. So we're now trying to make sure we get it right. Thank you very much. OK, thanks. Jim? Um, some of what you're saying sounds remarkably familiar. Um, have you had any contact whatsoever with the executive or any executive parties about this bill? No. None at all? Not at all. No either. letters, emails, phone calls? No, well, not that I'm not that I'm aware of, and I don't think we've. No, nope, we haven't had any no discussions. No pressure being put on you to take a certain view on this. <clears throat> no, and if it was, the commission is resolutely independent, and it would resist it. But we haven't had pressure from any of the five main parties or any of the other political parties. Have you seen the? Or from me? Through the chair, through the chair, behave. I've, I've already attempted to un unnerve Jim by agreeing with him on a, on a yes. number of occasions. But so. um, you've seen the evidence given by Mr. Murphy, the minister. Um, you'd almost, it was quite uncanny how much unison there is between you and him on, <clears throat> on the proportionality issue. Well, at, at the risk of destroying a kind of conspiracy theory, I actually haven't read. Uh, the, the evidence I've read has been up to the 6th of May, which was the David Sterling evidence. Mm -hmm. And I, didn't, I haven't had an opportunity to read the evidence that came from, I, I know Sue Gray and Connor Murphy were due to give evidence, but I haven't actually had a chance to read it. I couldn't find it actually on the, on the website. The it's story. not up yet. It's yeah, right. so. but, um, I can always say not even a friendly chat at a cocktail party, but of course that hasn't been possible over the last three months. Um, you talk, uh, like the Minister did and Mr Sterling did, remarkably similarly, about the importance of proportionality. Do you accept that the misbehaviour of the SPADs in the RHI brought this executive and this government down for three years? Do you accept that? Well, I, I, don't, I don't think it's uh, for, for me to, I mean, the, the Commission, to, to make a kind of judgment on that. We know what the facts were. We know the basis on which that all happened. I can offer an opinion on it, but my opinion is no more, has well, no more weight than anybody that else's. Of the chief executive of one of the most powerful bodies in Northern Ireland. So yes, it is important. Look, what, you wouldn't expect me, and I would not defend what happened around RHI, and we've had an inquiry. It's, the, the inquiry has, has, you know, has reached its conclusions. I'm not sure that my view of that, other than, and I said right at the outset, um, given the backdrop to this, I entirely understand why a bill like Jim Allister's is being put forward. That's progress. Are you aware of the controversy around things like NAMA and RHI? Uh, NAMA and, um, uh, NAM, yes, NAMA and Blue Sky, Red Sky. Sorry. Those, those, the, the previous issues were the conduct of special advisors was drawn into question. Yes, yeah, I'm, and I'm kind of not sure what you're offering here. I mean, um, it, it seems to me do, things have gone wrong in the past. 
they need to be remedied. Correct. The question of how you remedy them, whether by way of statute or a code, is not per se a human rights issue. And I'm saying, uh, frankly, I think it's probably helpful to, to Jim Alice that there is not a human rights imperative that says it must be one as opposed to the other. So that's a matter of judgment, which includes the judgment, presumably, of the Assembly, ultimately. And I'm saying there is not a human rights reason that drives you down one road as opposed to another. So just to, uh, because I think uh, we don't want to lead the witness, Jim. Oh, we do. We don't. No, we don't. No, we're not. And I'm not going to allow that. But the issue, and again, it comes back to the issue, yeah. is it's the issue. We are in a unique situation in Northern Ireland yeah. where if codes had been followed, we wouldn't have been in the situation where we were. So you say there is a compelling argument uh, to put it into a legislative framework. But the issue refers around the proportionality issue, which is whether there is a requirement there would be a criminal element to this and whether there would be criminal penalties to which you would do so. So that sort of puts it into a, a particular framework. And I'm not trying to put words into yeah. your thing, but I just want to make sure that we're... Well, it's, it's quite a key point. But yeah, it is. What I'm saying is it's, it's a matter of judgment ultimately for the Assembly, and that judgment is, for example, if a code of conduct was being used to deal with this, is that code of conduct sufficiently strong and effective to command, first of all, the confidence of the members of the Assembly, and I suspect more widely the confidence of members of the public? I mean, clearly the stronger and more effective a code of conduct is, the more likely that is to happen. Against that is the question of, would it command, ultimately, first of all, for the Assembly and wider public confidence if it was put in into some for stronger form of, of statute. We know that, in generally speaking, um, it's very unusual to find these kind of areas being dealt with by way of statutory safeguards. Because the question is, has what's happened in Northern Ireland generated such a concern publicly and politically that it should be. It's not being done by uh, in, in other parts of the United Kingdom and generally elsewhere. And would a reasonable person, having seen what happened with Red Sky, seen what happened in Nama, and seen what has happened uh, with RHI, has read carefully the recommendations of uh, Lord Justice Coughlin, would a reasonable person come down on the side of the argument that the past code of conduct system has failed wretchedly, miserably and totally failed and therefore we need to move on to something that's a statutory basis. Would that be reasonable? Jim, I, we, we've just had the last five or six days a debate about what a reasonable person would do and I'm not sure that that's... For the record he's not and he wasn't. <laughs> um, I, I understand the backdrop to this and that's why we are where we are today. Ultimately, it's a matter of judgment for the Assembly. What's your judgment? Uh, sorry, that's, uh, I think that's probably yeah, pushed the witness. The Commission doesn't take a position on this. But you have. You have. Can I tell you what's going to happen here? I would think nearly every MLA bar one party in this Assembly is totally sold on this bill and thinks it's an excellent idea. What will happen is then they will be ruthlessly whipped by their parties to, to burn this bill at the third reading stage. That's what's going to happen. And your words will be seized upon as the reason why that should happen, because you are not prepared to come down and say, we need this to happen. Well, I think, I've, I, think I have gone significantly further. I mean, I, it is a matter of judgment. It's, you know, I'm the head of the Human Rights Commission, <coughs> and our response to the bill has been confined to the human rights issues. You are right, I've got a bit further than that in terms of recognising the backdrop to this. So I'm not using human rights as a shield from saying anything um, publicly about this. But I think what I've said is as far as I'm prepared to go. I, if this bill fails or succeeds, I, I don't think it will be down to the human rights issues other than the aspects that I have raised about proportionality in criminal offences and the wisdom of criminal offences as a whole. Um, I have no desire to 
uh, hold this bill below the waterline on human rights grounds other than for the issues that we've raised? Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> let's be reasonable about it. Your words will be quoted on the floor of the Assembly, and they will be quoted by those who want to kill this bill. Can I ask you, on balance, your view of whether this should be a statutory code and also uh, sorry, with a legal backing, of course, and potential imprisonment. Is it a 50-50 judgment or would you be 70-30 or 80-20? How would, how would you come down on this? Because you say it, it's, 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 a, it's a balanced argument. Where's the balance lie? Jim, you're, 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 it's, it's doing your job, but you're trying to ask the same question under another guise, frankly. Yes, he is. Yes. And, uh, and I think at that point I'll, I'll stop it. But the reason why I give Jim this latitude, Les, is because we all know you quite well and uh, you will speak your mind. But thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Alice. Uh, thank you, Rose. Sean Han Yu. You're very welcome here today. Uh, and I, I can totally appreciate just uh, how you have compared, we'll say, the code of practice as opposed to have been uh, statutory sort of legislation and the implications thereof as well, too. One comment that I probably disagree with you on, just uh, if you don't mind me saying, whenever you said the code failed in the past, the code is only but a code. It didn't fail. It was people who failed it. And uh, those that failed it uh, was as a result of a culture, we'll say, even within a party or the likes of it, that failed that code. Um, and uh, as a result of that, uh, that's why it was that we found ourselves in the position that we are actually in today, even in terms of addressing this bill as well, too. Um, and the whole issue of personality is very, very important there in every respect. And in fact, then, in terms of the work that's carried out, we'll say, by SPADS in the first instance as well, too, and the amount of flexibility that exists, we'll say, for them in every way, uh, and in particular in them dealing with the minister. Um, I can see so many sort of uh, difficulties now that are in there that were still away it would uh, really leave a person nearly like in a, uh, a stick jacket in a sense, you know, in, in terms of, of the way it would limit them. Um, and in particular, when it when we are looking at RHI and how it was that um, they danced on the head of a pin in terms of a minister taking responsibility for a SPAD in the first instance. And I think that issue now also has been addressed in the new code uh, of practice that has been recommended. Um, and uh, the question that I actually come to that uh, I'm sure that you probably maybe have looked at that new code of practice as well too. Um, and, and I think that in it, that uh, they do address that particular issue a, of uh, ministerial responsibility, uh, and that in itself implies a control on that uh, on spads and so on. Um, so really, uh, I'm asking you, do, do you compare and contrast that as opposed to the code failing, a the culture, and the one addresses the culture itself, then this newly uh, proposed and strengthened code could be adequate. Uh, and uh, the other point that I just make as well too, whenever you do say that um, yes, it's possible to sort of design um, uh, statutory legislation, you could design statutory legislation for anything uh, at the end of the day. Uh, and uh, what we really have to ask yourself is that question, which of these situations sort of will uh, lend itself to better government, in particular now in the way that SPADs are actually handled? It, it, it's clear there's been a significant change to um, the approach. Whether, whether I mean, a code of conduct could be adequate and sufficient in human rights terms to deal with this. The question of, is a matter of judgment of whether, given the context now, given what's been placed in a code of conduct, that is deemed to be sufficient. In human rights terms, there is not something, as I said earlier, that says that uh, you have to have a code of conduct. Um, but if, if the Assembly decided to go down the code of conduct route, um, uh, then it could well be, and it, it could well be perfectly human rights compliant, and there's no human rights reason and not going down that road. The question is more of a question of judgment. So it's not, this is not a, a kind of uh, the, uh, 
Human Rights Commission kicks the ball into touch either way because of a human rights consideration and before you know it there is no choice but to have a code of conduct because the Human Rights Commission has said the only way to deal with this effectively is a code of conduct but neither is there a the only way to deal with this is a, um, a, a statutory safeguard either of those can be provoked. I, you know, bearing in mind what's drafted in both the code of conduct or uh, a statutory piece of legislation could be perfectly human rights compliant in the way of dealing with this. I'm um, sorry, to, I'm not a great sitter on offence, but in terms of this, there is not a kind of imperative that said it must be one over the other. It really is a matter of judgment. Uh, and just to follow on on that, uh, is that no, I, I think, in fact, that you're not sitting on offence at all. You're stating the reality. Yeah. And the reality of the situation is, as I said, that you could design, with say, statutory legislation that conforms to human rights in every respect, as does, say, the code of practice in itself. So it doesn't an either or situation in that respect uh, uh, in terms of human rights. It's neither or situation in terms of what is it that serves uh, government uh, best uh, and, and serving government best, hopefully, it serves the interests of the people as well, too. Yeah, just in terms of what Les is saying, I mean, really our major concern, and it's been said over and over again, isn't whether this is statutory or the Code of Conduct. The issue is that the proportionality issue of criminal offences. Putting a disciplinary process into either of those two you know, is, is one thing. I guess the question for the Assembly and the Committee is, uh, and this is the issue that we have a concern with, going beyond that to creating a specific set of criminal offences is that necessary and proportionate? And one of the questions to be asked is, what does it do that the existing criminal framework doesn't already provide? For example, um, in, the, in the example that Jim had said earlier about things that might constitute up to the level of fraud, mm -hmm. fraud is already a criminal offence. So is it necessary to add a new criminal law into an area? And is it wise, as Les had said, when on the one hand you have a disciplinary process for, for people who amount to employees, versus the criminal framework that's being proposed and mixing those two up. Yeah. That's the, where the human rights issues lie in this. And I, I also just emphasise the same point that uh, um, so we would like that uh, we all know that um, the death penalty is not a deterrent, say, for murder in a sense, uh, no more than uh, that um, and making a, a criminal offence that uh, what, what penalty you impose is going to deter if that culture exists. That's why I made the point that if that culture exists, then people will find ways of circumventing codes, uh, legislation, irrespective of what way it is presented. Uh, and that's the main issue that uh, probably has to be addressed in itself within a party or the likes of it. Yeah, well, the, the, the reality is, depending on what's in a statute, that um, not adhering to a statute generally speaking, has greater ramifications than not adhering to a code of conduct. As a general rule, the question again becomes how, how strong and what the sanctions are that are contained in a code of conduct, as opposed to what sanctions you might contain within a, within a statute. The questions about proportionality are about, there's, there's policy questions about having criminal offences, how widely they're drawn, and the level of sentence. And it's fair to say that human rights law around sentencing and proportionality has been focused much more on on the kind of whole life term kind of arrangements not on this kind of this kind of arrangement but it probably still brings these kind of arrangements into the arena of proportionality and sentencing and human rights you could make an article 3 argument about inhuman and degrading treatment if you had a very very severe sentence for what looked like a, a relatively minor crime um, uh, but that's quite a high threshold to get over in terms of Article 3 uh, and amounting to inhuman and degrading treatment. Um, so the proportionality is about the level of sentence, etc. But uh, as I say, this is not a kind of one, it must be one as opposed to another for human rights reasons. Hmm. Thanks. Well, yeah, I suppose one culture of that is, is suppose the previous experience we've had with Sinn Féin bypassing the previous bad bill that Jim had uh, proposed uh, in the in the house C can I can I keep you on clause 11 um, sure and, and your your concerns around proportionality 
Um, and you use the word, uh, you suggest that, by, for example, the inclusion of the word improper uh, preceding benefit in 920 of the bill could add much to it with regards to uh, <coughs> proportionality, I suppose, and, and not having it so free for all. Uh, I, I think that probably is a, is a good use of term there with regards to that. Uh, but then how, how, who defines improper? Well, ultimately, that would be a matter for um, prosec initially <coughs> prosecutorial authorities and then ultimately judicial authorities. In other words, if somebody wanted to bring a... If, if you create a criminal offence and the question was about improper benefit, um, then... Ultimately, you'd have an investigation. When you move to prosecution, then prosecuting authorities would have to look at the circumstances and decide whether it met the threshold for prosecution. And then if it did, then it would be a matter, ultimately, for a judge to decide, mm -hmm. on hearing a case, whether that threshold was met in terms of the law. So th that's the process that you go through. Uh, when Jim gave evidence um, to this committee about the penalties in the two clauses, uh, clause 9 and clause 11, uh, I, th I think through memory he said that he thought that the clause 11 offence was of a greater nature and stature to clause, clause 9 offence. Uh, you are worried about the, the sweeping nature of it and then the proportionality of the, the, the tariff itself, the conviction itself. Is there a way to, to resolve your fear in that, in, in that, that you could actually detail out certain offences or activities that would be offences, and then you could give it, give it a separate tariff, yeah, and a scale of tariff, if you like? I don't think it's... And I'm sure Jim wouldn't like the Human Rights Commission to be <laughs> drafting his uh, um, his bill. That would be a, a fairly unusual, um, very weak. And, uh, I'm almost tempted to say unholy um, um, alliance. But um, <laughs> to, to, be, um, to, um, to be serious for a second, in terms of this, yeah, you would have to draw. I, at the moment, this is drawn extremely wide, wide, uh, widely. So you are. It's directly or indirectly, let's put about commercially sensitive a second, confidential information. Does that, for example, um, you know, Sam McBride is on next. If a special political advisor had a conversation with Sam McBride about something um, in order to kind of give the minister's view of something and it appeared in a newspaper two or three days later, has that person committed a, a criminal offence? Is that something which you would expect normally special political advisers to, to do potentially as drafted that appears to be a potential criminal offence in my reading of, of clause 11. Um, now that is in a very different space from somebody who has commercially you know, sensitive information and goes and says to somebody um, I shares in this because I have got some information that's going to suggest that it will be in your, to your advantage to do it and get the rest of uh, everybody else that I know to do the same thing in order to gain from some confidence, some kind of corrupt or other purpose. So both of those seem to me currently to be caught within this. This, um, and I think that it's what is the role of a, a special political advisor? We can kind of debate that, but it it does seem to me that part of that uh, that role is is to be the political antennae. So issues like should a special political advisor have a conversation with a journalist in order to get um, a minister's view about something um, briefed before the day before something happens. Well, it looks to me as if that's a potential offence under this, and it doesn't seem proportionate to me. But you, you, just, just, uh, just, just uh, so that area, which we would normally understand as the sort of normal relationship between political discourse between that and sort of the media yes. and back and forth. But the real concern we have is obviously um, insider trading, information that's gone to, uh, let's say, the agribusiness community that has been to the exclusion of other elements of the agribusiness community. That is what has happened. And this is my understanding of why we need to probably have that intent within here, 
and I think you've already used the word, Mr. Les, you used the word deterrent impact within it. Now, there is, not, there is obviously a very discreet case for special advisers, politicians, and the media, which is sort of a, a, a normal political discourse. But there is a completely different approach from sort of um, special advisers, politicians, and business giving uh, financial and pecuniary advantage. Yes. So, if the element of the proportionality was dealt with in a way that split those. Would that remove part of your? You, you would have to look at what the drafting looked like. What, what, I'm, I mean, I, what I'm saying is that if it is properly focused on on what I think would be, you know, reasonable offences. So, in, in terms of, take the example you've given. If somebody was doing this for their own pecuniary or or their acolyte's pecuniary gain. There was no base. There was no basis other than for their own financial or personal gain. They were leaking commercially sensitive information, or take it even more. If somebody was paying somebody, you know, said paying somebody to say, "Give us in advance what's going," you know, well, that's happened. But I'm saying in those kinds of circumstances, then that may well be proportionate. But again, without seeing how it's drafted. Um, all I'm saying, I think, at this stage is how this is currently drafted is, um, is not proportionate in the view of the Commission. It is too widely drawn. Because it's the breadth of it rather than the implications of specific. You're, you're, there, there's, right. two, there's two issues, really, on this clause. So one is, um, as Les and I think Jim was addressing earlier, the intended target. So that's too broad, in our view, at the minute. Um, concerns about whistleblowing and the suggestion is that it might be amended in order to narrow the scope of, that, of the clause in that regard. And then the second aspect of it is that the nature of the activity that's trying to be captured to constitute a criminal offence. And it's not clear at the minute that that also isn't extremely broadly drawn. And there's really two questions I see to be addressed in order to, to determine whether or not it's proportionate. And the first one is, can you create a list? that narrows down the scope to provide the legal certainty as to what sort of activity is trying to be captured by the clause. And then that leads on to a second question is, is it necessary to do that, i.e. are the activities in question not already criminal offences? So, so on that point, so if you have activity that we want to capture in, in some sort of statute yes, with activity ongoing in the past, but there's no real way to investigate that activity because it's under a cloak, if you like, of codes and the minister has to step in and say A, B or C. Is there not a danger that there could be criminal activity ongoing that can't come to the surface or can't come to the attention of the enforcement body, the police? Well, if, if there's criminal activity outside of this bill, um, I mean, what I suppose of the lessons of the RHI is eventually this did all come into the public domain um, and, and as a result um, and part of the coming into the public domain was whistleblowing but it was much more than that um, uh, but, and, and David is right that there's, a, there's a policy judgement question about whether you want to create criminal offences I don't think the Commission is saying, the Commission's position is, as a human rights issue, you can create these offences. Whether it's wise to, it's not a matter for us to, that's a judgment that has to be made. Uh, I'm not a great fan, and I, and I it was a, of creating criminal offences unless there is a compelling reason to do so. That's a matter of judgment, it's not a matter of human rights per se. The question of human rights is, is it proportionate if you do create a criminal offence? Um, you talk, in your written evidence, you talk about uh, Article 10 uh, compliance and having, you know, having a defence if there's a strong public interest to disclose. And I get that. Uh, you know, people have to be able to think independently and act independently and have a conscience, no matter what role they're in. Yeah. Uh, but who, who judges the strength of public interest? Because you, you alluded to earlier, what, six days of debate around a lot of nonsense 
whenever the media really should have been concentrating on the actual draconian legislation and the effect that that has on the nation. The well, yeah. public, who, who defines and judges what is of public interest? Well, we already have public interest disclosure um, legislation for whistleblowing. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that's a matter for, in Northern Ireland, industrial tribunals, for example, if it was a matter of unfair dismissal. If you have other public interest defences, then it becomes a matter for the courts, ultimately, and, and judges to decide. Um, um, and that, that's obviously based on kind of case-by-case -case basis. It's worth saying that, for example, um, within the Official Secrets Act, as I understand it, there is no public interest disclosure. So there are issues around you know, legislation where the public interest disclosure doesn't apply. Public interest disclosure is generally about keeping your, you know, if you whistleblow about the ability to keep your job, here you're moving into different territory. You know, I think this is a matter this bill would have to deal with. The public interest disclosure defence would be about keeping you out of, potentially out of prison, as opposed to <coughs> out of your job. And I think that's a very different um, set of concerns. And I move back to what I said before about deterrent effect. Mm -hmm. If I am a person who sees something that shouldn't be happening, and I think, well, should I go on public record because I know this is wrong? Um, but if I do, I may have to go to prison for it. That's a bigger concern than, but it's still a very significant concern, for example, as a civil servant. If I go on the record here, this may impact on my career, including whether I'm still in a job. That's pretty, pretty tough, but it's very different from I could face imprisonment. Um, so there are some issues around public interest disclosure and this claw, even putting in a public interest disclosure. It's not just about what the impact, and that gives you a defence. Does it deter you from speaking out in the first place? And I think that's where you move into the policy kind of judgments that you have to make around whether a criminal offence, even with a public interest disclosure defence, is wise or not. <coughs> It's not a matter for the Human Rights Commission to say yes or no to that, but I think it's important that that's placed on the record in terms of the, the kind of considerations that ultimately the Assembly um, will have to make. Okay, thank you. Thank you, yeah, um, Matthew. Yeah, just sorry, sorry, in terms of what Les was saying, I, I mean, what might be instructive to the committee in terms of when we were looking at the background is on this issue. Um, what was the old Official Secrets Act was revised in, in order to narrow down. Probably wrong was the Ponting defence, wasn't it, at the yeah. time of Belgrano? So it was narrowed down yeah. partly because of the issue of freedom of expression and disclosure, yep. so that public servants wouldn't be captured and would feel more free in order to act in the public interest. I mean, that's part of the reason. So, to the extent that there's legislation that attaches to criminal offences for public servants and their activities. The legislative trajectory by Parliament on this issue has been to narrow down in order to allow people to more freely exercise their rights. Thank you. I, I, I think that's right, except in the case of official secrets, where actually public interest disclosure is not, is not a defence, as I understand it, and that, is, that takes you back to Clive Hunting and, yeah. Yeah. and the response to... But surely there is... Sorry, sorry I'll, I'll bring Matthew in here in a second. Just to, just to get this right in my own head, but surely within the, the public interest disclosure piece, and also within the sort of the current the sort of the rules and regulations about whistleblowing as there is at the moment, there is a very distinctive difference. We seem to be coming to this at two different approaches. We're coming here for you're talking about the protection of somebody who would like to whistleblow but's not going to do it because he thinks he's going to be prosecuted or he or she's going to be prosecuted. Our views come, or sorry, I'm paraphrasing I'm, what I suppose is maybe our view is the problem is that in the past, because there has been no deterrent value, there has been no approach to actually try and stop bad behaviour. And the problem we have with, and one of the reasons we're in this position, is because we have a, we've had a code, we've had codes, we've had rules, we've had all sorts of things that have been blatantly ignored. So to use the words of uh, the head of the, the civil service here in Northern Ireland, we are in a unique situation. That is, the, that is the reason why we are considering whether we need to bring in legislation to the process as well. So in many respects, the Ponting defence is still there and would still apply, surely. Well, outside of the um, outside of Official Secrets Act for a second, yeah, 
Yes, it does. But there's right. still the question of if it's a criminal offence potentially to disclose confidential information, will that inhibit me from doing so in circumstances um, as opposed to I know I may put my job at risk if I do this, although I've still got the public interest disclosure defence to, to fall back on. That the stakes are higher. That's the reality of, of, um, of having a criminal offence. And, and do those higher stakes mean somebody might be more circumspect about blowing the whistle? Okay. Matthew. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you for being patient with various um, questions. And we've uh, realised you've been um, been down in quite broad um, principles. Um, I have a couple of just a couple of very brief questions. Um, in the what we do section of your website, um, under our core activities, it mentions, in addition to um, UN principles, it also mentions the Nolan principles. Um, that is, uh, I think it's Sir Christopher Nolan, not, no, not the, a different Nolan. type of Nolan who unfortunately governs public life in this country Rudy. a little bit more than um, some people might like. Um, he, uh, what role do the Nolan's, is that, when you refer to the Nolan principles there, is that about how you do your work or is it about, you're not, you don't have a statutory or normative function to <coughs> uphold Nolan principles? No, that, that's, about, that's about we adhere to the Nolan yep. principles, so the kind of openness, etc., the, the, the seven principles of public life, which, is, which are the Nolan principles, um, we would expect both me, my commissioner colleagues, and staff to adhere to those, and it's particularly, obviously, in public appointment terms, the commissioners and myself would adhere to the seven principles. Not that we have a role in, I mean, there are other organizations that deal with the question of how people behave in public, public life. We're not, that's not a primary purpose of, of the uh, Human Rights Commission. Okay, um, and um, one of your other roles is, in a sense, placing Northern Ireland in the context of international human rights practice you, with the UN Declaration and various other um, ECHR, etc. Um, in terms of what you mentioned before, your back, the, the, the sort of background, the homework you did preparing a response to this, um, are you aware of um, other statutory, um, uh, of, of other jurisdictions putting in practice um, this kind of statutory underpinning to um, are you aware of the jurisdictions basically where this is put in? Did you did you did you compare and contrast in terms of when you were doing the human rights comparator? Uh, no, and at the uh, danger of saying a dog ate my homework. No, no. As I, as I understand it, but I'm I don't profess to be an expert kind of in this in this field about jurisdictions elsewhere. But I'm not I'm not aware of many other places where a kind of statutory set of, of safeguards have been put in place. <coughs> Certainly in the rest of the UK, and as I understand the rest of these islands, there isn't. But are there examples somewhere where this has been done? I couldn't put my hand on my heart and say, um, I know for certain there isn't. I'm not aware of them, but I don't profess to be. There are some fairly stringent rules within the EU, particularly <coughs> if you're working as a special advisor within the EU and any of those processes. And they are subject to quite some stringent sort of rules and regulations. And I think there is some legislative framework around that as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah, th there's certainly something within the uh, EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. I think it's Article 49, but I can't uh, recall exactly what. Uh, but it, so but that only applies in terms of the in the use of EU law. So there, there are some provisions, for example, about protection of confidentiality, etc. But um, and there's some body of casework quite recently about sort of um, sort of breaches of that and sort of whistleblowing as well, wasn't there? Um, there may well be, but I'm not I'm not familiar with, and I'd I'd be skating on thin ice, frankly, to start attempting to to talk about something that yeah. I'm just not that conversant with. Okay. Matthew, um, that's that's me. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you. 
Yes. Thank you very much oh, indeed. Thank you. And uh, if we have any other uh, written, other remaining questions or whatever it is, would you mind if we forward those to you? Sort of yeah, no, no, not at all. Bring yeah. back as well. And thank you very much indeed. Yeah. And thank you very much indeed for your time. Yeah, not at all. And if we stayed to listen to Sam, is that acceptable currently? And yeah. if you can, if you can manage social six, if you can manage, if you can manage socially distance apart six feet, which will mean one over there and one over there, yeah. the answer to that is yes. Yeah. Don't pass within six feet to each other coming in and out. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Chair. Yeah. Thanks. So you have have to go out. No, you have to go out and come back in. You're all right that way, aren't you? No, no it doesn't. It doesn't connect. Hmm. Right. More questions. What question is this all? Hmm? It's like the song, more questions than answers. Yeah, that's. Miss, that was food for thought. Sam, come on in. <coughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Sam McBride. Uh, well-known uh, Northern Ireland journalist and author. That you still haven't given me any royalties yet for the number of times I've mentioned the word bur bur "burned." Um, I've already made a declaration here that I will not be asking particular questions of Sam because of uh, uh, previous relationships that we have had. But uh, you're welcome. Uh, the agenda item has been recorded by Hansard. I would just like to draw the members' attention to the clerk's briefing paper at page 23 and uh, Mr. McBride's submission paper at page 25. And um, have we lost the human rights? All right, sorry. If you just wait a second, Sam, we're just. Uh, don't know whether Les is trying to work his way through the myriad of human rights legislation or just trying to find the door. I think he's trying to operate the water cooler, if I'm correct. <laughs> I give it 60 seconds, and then time in this committee waits for no man or woman. Sam, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee, for the invitation to come here today. Um, first of all, just to clarify, I'm here personally today, so I'm the political editor of the newsletter. I'm not representing the newsletter. There's no conflict with the newsletter. My editor knows that I'm here today, but I'm really speaking about this um, as somebody who has covered this place for over a decade um, and obviously covered the RHI scandal in particular over the last few years, um, touching on lots of these issues. Um, it's not for me to say whether this bill should be supported. That's not my role as a journalist. Um, that is your job. Um, but I think it's clear, and it seems to be accepted from the evidence of I think most of the members today and from what I've picked up beforehand, that there is a problem which has to be addressed here. The argument is as to how we address that and whether this is the correct and proportionate way to do that. Um, and for those saying that this is not the way to deal with it, I think the onus is on those people and the obvious question for those people is, well, what is their alternative? And the alternative we know from the minister, from his evidence um, about a fortnight ago, is saying that it's about codes, it's about putting this into a code of practice. We know that Sue Gray, um, his permanent secretary, who is hugely experienced in this um, area, unusually experienced in this area for, for a Northern Ireland permanent secretary, um, has, has endorsed that effectively um, and has said that um, the code that now exists or will exist going forward is written in a way that is much easier to understand. Now, that might imply that the last code was difficult to understand or that somehow our poor spads just couldn't get their heads around that passing confidential government documents to family members, for instance, or to Peter Robinson's son because he was the son of the First Minister or his corporate clients was in some way um, uh, not forbidden. I mean, I think nobody really seriously would make that contention. They knew what they were doing was wrong. That was why this was almost inevitably being hidden um, on these hidden systems, um, phones, email accounts, WhatsApp, whatever it might have been. Um, and so therefore, I'm not, I'm not convinced that that really gets to the kernel of what is going on here. Um, what we did have were rules, lots of rules. Um, the difficulty was that the rules were unenforced or unenforceable. And so therefore, in the words of Andrew McCormick, and I'm paraphrasing him here rather than quoting him directly, but effectively he said that um, on paper there were rules, but the, the, the nature of our institutions meant that they were quite difficult to enforce. Now, that's very carefully phrased from a senior civil servant. Effectively, what that means is that there was a culture of anarchy here where it looked like there were rules. The rules were written down. Anybody who came in and inspected the rules would have said, well, yes, there are rules here. 
but the rules were meaningless. We knew they were meaningless. Um, and I think the, the danger of this is that we get into sort of a party political debate as to which party was worst. Um, we know about the DUP failures in this, and to, to, a, to a certain extent, I think to a lesser extent, but to a significant extent, Sinn Féin's failures because of the RHI inquiry and because they were tangled up in that. Um, in that period, the other parties that are now in the executive were not in the executive at the point where that inquiry was set up. Um, it would be wrong to impugn the integrity of the other parties by suggesting that they probably were doing the same thing, but they might have been. We just don't know. Um, and so, therefore, where, where you have this very thick veil of secrecy, the only way that we get to the truth is when you have something very unusual and rare, like a public inquiry, which compels the handing over of um, previously private um, and confidential information. Um, and I think one of the key tests of whether this new regime, whether it's this bill, whether it's the code, succeeds is not just in terms of public confidence, which we know is important because this place was down for three years and very few of the public were marching in the streets to get it back. And so therefore there is a significant vested interest for I think everyone in this room and anybody who, who cares about this place in getting this right so that the public believe that people who behave badly can be held to account within the system without the entire system having to be toppled to deal with those people, um, as was seen by some people to be <coughs> necessary the uh, last time. I think the key thing here will be, does anyone ever lose their job over bad behaviour in this place? Or do they fear losing their job? Or do they fear any other significant sanctions, such as a loss of their salary or a portion of their salary or a fine? And I don't really see any evidence of that in the code as it's drafted at the moment. Um, it is held up that the code as it is drafted uh, really moves things forward very significantly because it clarifies that the minister is accountable for his or her uh, SPAD's discipline, as if that was the problem. That was not the problem. Um, in fact, in many ways, the fact that the minister was responsible for discipline of the SPAD, I think, was part of the difficulty. So, for instance, with Nelson McCausland and Stephen Brimstone, we knew that there was, and I'm, I'm throwing that out as a, as a rare example of where this got to the stage of disciplinary procedures, there was a recommendation to discipline the SPAD, and the minister simply blocked it. So, that doesn't solve things, and um, that doesn't improve public confidence. And very often in these situations, I think the suspicion um, from reasonable people would be that where the SPAD is acting in a bad uh, way, in an improper way, that they're not doing that without the knowledge of the minister. They're doing that with the knowledge of the minister, if not in the specifics of what they're doing at that point, as to their general modus operandi. And so, therefore, is it reasonable, is it, um, is it really seriously expected that a minister who is perhaps putting in place this system is actually going to police people who are, respons are clearly responsible for uh, breaking rules. Um, and then just two, two suggestions which I, I put to the committee very briefly in writing, just to expand on those slightly um, as to difficulties, I think, um, I think unintended difficulties, it's fair to say, based on what Mr Alistair has said um, of how the bill is currently drafted. And I think, again, this is, this is accepted by um, most people in this room, whether they support or oppose the bill at this point. Um, clause 11, uh, in, in, in terms of the um, difficulty that that might pose for whistleblowers, and I'm, I'm treading on some of the same territory as the Human Rights Commission here, albeit from a, from a different perspective. One unintended consequence of that is clearly that you could be penalising whistleblowers who are acting in the public interest. So can you distinguish between somebody who um, is blowing the whistle on RHI, let's say, for sake of argument? Clearly that's not something that you would want to imprison somebody for or fine somebody for. Um, and somebody who is passing confidential government documents to the relatives, which have the implication of saying the scheme's shutting quickly. You don't get in quickly, you're not going to get your boiler. Now, those are completely divergent positions, and I think that needs to be clarified. Um, however, I think that can be clarified because the bill gives this um, or provides for this reasonable excuse defence of using um, private email accounts, for instance, but there isn't that defence, as I understand it on my reading of the bill, um, on the confidential information clause. And so, therefore, if a public interest defence was added to, um, to, to that other clause, I think that would potentially um, at least go a very significant way um, to removing that difficulty, although I think there, 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 is, there is still the, um, the need to make that very explicit in the bill because there is the potential, as the Human Rights Commission were saying before me, of a sort of chilling effect where even if in law there wouldn't be a difficulty, Joe Bloggs, as a civil servant, looking to do the right thing, thinks there might be, and why should he risk his, you know, his, his job and his um, personal liberty for it doing the right thing? And 
on that point, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. I have no expertise in law whatsoever. Um, but I know a little bit about the libel laws. And um, in the libel laws, there are very significant defences for, um, for various categories of um, what are seen to be public interest um, actions, which otherwise might be defamatory. So, for instance, as we speak here today, no one can sue us for anything we say, no matter how outrageous it might be. And that is seen in law as a very clear absolute defence and it's it's understood to be there for a good reason and obviously it shouldn't be abused. So therefore I think it is possible to put very robust um, mechanisms into a bill like this um, which could protect those who, who, who are not meant to be ensnared by it. And I think also just finally on, on this point of whistleblowers, I think it's very important to err on the side of accepting that someone is a whistleblower and they're acting for um, public interest reasons rather than putting too great a hurdle in front of them in doing that. And if I could illustrate that with one example from the RHI um, situation. So in January 2017, there was a brown envelope that landed on my desk in the newsletter newsroom when I came into the newsroom one day. Um, it had been delivered by Ro Royal Mail. It was addressed to me. There was no other evidence as to who had sent it. So I didn't know. I had no idea. During the public inquiry, I learned that that was sent by John Robinson, who was the special advisor to the economy minister at that point, Simon Hamilton. Um, the, the emails contained within that um, pointed the finger essentially away from the DUP and at civil servants. Now, you might think that obviously, therefore, that ought to be an offence. And I don't think that should be an offence for this reason. I'm not saying it's proper, and it's not for me to decide whether that was proper or not. I've got a vested interest as the journalist who wrote the story, clearly. But I think that somebody can have impure motives in blowing the whistle, as clearly John Robinson had. I mean, he was trying to protect, I think, actually himself, as I make clear in the book, rather than necessarily even his party. But even if he was trying to protect the party, if what he was doing was still in the public interest, I don't think that, um, uh, that difficulty for him ought to defeat the um, defence, if that makes sense, because what was in those emails was true. It was accurate. It was a very significant development. This was not simply a story about political chicanery. This was about the civil service. We now know so much more, and I feel um, much more confident about the rightness of us publishing that information, because we know that those civil servants were deeply flawed, let's say, in terms of how they approached their roles. Um, and so therefore, I think it is, it is easy to look at hard cases and make bad law. And we should definitely, I think, err, err or you rather, I, I, I should say, should err on the side of um, the whistleblower there. Um, and also, one point that I, that I took from what the Human Rights Commission had said was um, around a SPAD briefing the media, which again is a, is a very good point, um, and a, I think an unintended consequence of this. Um, and I think that is something which either could be made a reasonable excuse, or, or potentially does not need to be made a reasonable excuse because, as I understand it, part of the SPAD role is to communicate with their party. Um, and so do does that extend to then communicating to a party press officer who briefs the media, as in my experience generally is the case, rather than dealing directly with SPADs? I mean, both of those things happen, but um, generally it comes through a party. Um, or is that, is that needed to be spelled out? I mean, I'm not the best person to give detailed evidence on that, but I think that that, that could be dealt with. And then the, the second area, which I think um, is an unintended consequence, perhaps, of this, is the issue of private emails. Um, and I think that possibly, and I think this um, crucially is really open to consideration, regardless of whether the Assembly accepts this bill and these clauses as drafted, or whether it rejects them and says we shouldn't make criminal offences, even if it decides not to make criminal offences, I think this could be a um, significant deterrent to some of the worst behaviour that we have seen in this place particularly by special advisers, but not only by special advisers. And that is the possibility of a new clause that would essentially encourage SPADs. So it wouldn't be a big stick as such, but it would encourage SPADs not to conduct their work on private um, accounts, private electronic devices or email accounts. Um, and it would be a clause that would make clear that if they do so, then civil servants independent of themselves, if they are a civil servant, but generally I think this is probably more applicable to SPADs or, or uh, ministers even, um, should be able to go into their private email accounts and inspect the government business that exists in those accounts. Now, I've, I've got some experience of this because Andrew Crawford, we now know, who was the special advisor to Arlene Foster for most of her ministerial career, operated, it seems, overwhelmingly from a Hotmail account. Um, we got some of those um, emails through the RHI inquiry, otherwise we would never have seen them. Um, and so therefore, off the back of that, I went to the fo his former department. I made a freedom of information request because this was material that was created in his role as a government employee, paid for by me as a taxpayer. I had a right, I believed, under the law to access his emails. 
And the department came back and said, we can't do this because he, uh, he, he owns his account and he's left the department. So you can see in that an incredible perverse incentive for someone who is a special yeah. advisor or a minister who wants to hide anything. Why would they ever use a government account if there's no sanction? Why on earth? Now, in the, in the evidence from the minister and from Sue Gray, there was the suggestion that, the, that, that there would be a tougher disciplinary process. But it seems that ultimately when you get to the end of that, and I've spoken to some of the people involved in drafting this, when you get to the end of that, it's essentially the hope that in the court of public opinion, the minister will be embarrassed enough to do the right thing. Um, and I think that's potentially a naive way of approaching this. Um, and just, just finally, um, I think that there, there, is, um, there, there was one other point which the, uh, the Human Rights Commission had raised, which I thought was interesting. Um, they, uh, if I can read my own writing here, um, Yes, they, they, they said that um, fraud, for instance, is already a criminal offence. So essentially, why do you need to create a new criminal offence when we know that that most extreme form of abuse, let's say, is already criminal? That, of course, is correct. It's self-evident. However, there's a difficulty with this. How do we know the fraud has taken place if we're not able to ever access these documents? So the RHI inquiry is the exception to the rule because it got into these private accounts. And even then, the inquiry was suspicious that some of these people were not handing over everything, and they had to keep going back to them and threatening them with very significant sanctions if they didn't play ball. So in, in this situation, as things stand, and as I understand it, as the code sits at the minute, the onus is on the individual to be the arbiter of whether this information should ever be released to a committee of this assembly, to the public via freedom of information, to a court, to any other body. And that's not the rule for other public um, sector employees. And so therefore, I think there is a need for some way of ensuring that there's a deterrent to that. Okay. Thanks very much, Lisa. Matthew. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that evidence, Sam. And the written evidence is extremely thorough. Um, I have a, f a few questions, I suppose. Um, first of all, if it's within the parameters of, what of our discussion today, were you, sort of, were you surprised by the Cochrane report and its and the, um, uh, the import of its findings? Um, I, I, I was very surprised. I mean, I've, I've, I've said this. I, I thought that it would be um, much tougher in terms of the language that it used. Um, I think that anyone who sat through the evidence of the inquiry um, and listened to it, most of what is in the report is, a, is a, essentially a narrative of what happened, but we already knew that by the time we got to the report. There are recommendations, um, there are findings, clearly. The key finding is that this was not corruption, um, but beyond that, a lot of the findings, I think, are pretty self-evident that a minister ought to be accountable for their SPAD. Well, I mean, I think that to most reasonable people was obvious before this process, um, and that SPADs, for instance, should not be passing confidential material to, to relatives, etc., etc. A lot of it was kind of obvious, and based on what happened in this room and based on the, the demeanour and I think the public confidence that was derived from how the panel, all three of them, approached their roles um, very robustly, without fear or favour, with everyone from all political parties, civil servants, all sorts of people, the people who set up the inquiry, the, Everyone, um, I think that it was it was very surprising that it that it said what it said. And do you think, in your experience re reporting in this place since um, January, has there been any evidence? Obviously, notwithstanding COVID nineteen has, has has created a unique context, but has there been uh, have you seen any evidence of change in terms of how um, business is done? Again, notwithstanding the fact that COVID nineteen has changed everything. Um, it's very difficult to answer that question, um, partly because of COVID and partly because we're, we're at a very early stage, and these issues tend to tumble out um, much later down the line. So if you look at, if you look at RHI, if you look at Red Sky, if you look at any of these scandals, um, SIF, whatever, it, just, it t tends to be a year, two years down the line before we get to the point where people start coming forward and saying, actually, there is a, there is a difficulty here. In terms of um, how, um, how people communicate, um, you have taught, and, and it's a question we've discussed here, and indeed I, um, when Jim Malster gave evidence to, to this committee, um, I asked about it, about a, a journalistic defence and exempting both normal interaction between press officers, spads and journalists, but also kind of whistleblowing. Um, does, so clause 11 is, the, is the, the clause that, you know, it, it may be amended, and Jim has acknowledged that, that there are issues there, but would you say that Clause 9 as well, could, that there might be an issue with Clause 9 in terms of interacting, but interactions between um, interesting people and the media? Yeah, they're both, they both overlap um, in the sense that, um, yeah, 
I mean, both both potentially come into play here. Um, I think that there there is. I, I I believe there is no issue, but I'm not a lawyer, and there'll be other people who can advise you on this. But I believe that because a SPAD as part of their role can brief their party, that that is not improper. So I think the use of the word improper in this is. Uh, I think it was improper in terms of improper benefit, but um, is helpful because uh, it it is clear there that 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 is not out with their role. That is their role, and so that's them doing their jobs. That that was never really the issue here. Do you think so? One of the things I've been trying, I think that it's really important in understanding this is the unique context of this place and the fact that there's mandatory coalition. Um, do you think that the very nature of how power sharing here works means that it is more important that there is statutory underpinning? Um, and I'm not asking you, you're not endorsing whether there should be statutory underpinning, but do you think it, the nature of mandatory coalition and power sharing? Means there sh there is a need for an enhanced level of um, scrutiny or penalty for bad behaviour. Yes, because we have no opposition in this place. I think that that is the key difference with other um, jurisdictions. If you have an opposition, they are funded, they are incentivised. It's in their they have a vested interest in trying to turf out these guys who are currently in the executive and get in. So therefore, there is that sort of healthy tension in the system. When you don't have that, clearly there is a difficulty. But I think that it's a mistake to simply look at other jurisdictions and say, well, they don't have it. And even if we didn't have these unique circumstances in Northern Ireland, that that that's okay. Look at what's happening in London at the moment. Look at some of what's happened in Dublin. I think. I think there, there is an inherent difficulty where you have incredibly powerful people who are not accountable within the system. And we know that, for instance, Dominic Cummings has been using private um, means of communication to keep things off the system. Once you do that, um, not just in terms of the here and now, but in terms of the historical record that we get as declassified files in 20 years' time, it's corrupted to an extent that we don't actually know whatever went on. That's not healthy. Don't you think there's a possibility, though, that if, you, um, if, if we accept for the purpose of assumption that a certain amount of correspondence um, will always happen off official channels, that, 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 that you can't completely legislate away, um, you can't legislate away private conversations, you can't legislate away phone conversations. I don't know if you use Signal, lots of journalists do, that's a new messaging app that wipes out messages um, after they're, I'm told. Um, the, after they've been sent after a certain period of time. What I'm asking is, um, don't you think that by, um, for example, outlawing the use of Gmail, literally outlawing it, outlawing the use of WhatsApp, you push communications into ever more, um, even more offline places in the public, and, and the record is even more um, denuded? You you potentially do, but bear in mind this, that if there's a criminal sanction, um, you don't know what's happened at the other end of that communication. So every communication involves at least two people. What we saw in the RHI inquiry was very interesting. We had special advisers who did not hand over communications, and then another special advisor who was the recipient of that did hand it over. And that's the difficulty. And if, if, if you think there's a very big sword hanging over you, I think you would think twice about that. But it's... It, I, I think it's a mistake to think about this. If I've interpreted this correctly from what has been said earlier in terms of the amendments to this potentially coming forward, that is about outlawing things like Gmail or Hotmail or whatever it might be, um, clearly those are going to be used in extremists. You, you don't want some sort of bureaucratic system where there's an emergency, as we're in at the minute, and somebody feels, oh, I don't have the right BlackBerry with me, I can't, I can't send an email, it needs to be sent. There is a very easy way of dealing with that, where you retrospectively give somebody a period of, let's say, seven days, let's say a month, whatever it might be, and you have to get that back into the department, and the onus is on you. And likewise, there is a reasonable um, excuse in that for specific circumstances, and there's a public interest <coughs> test as to somebody who's going to be prosecuted under that. Is it in the public interest to do that? And I think that if, there's, if it's self-evident that this is a, um, <coughs> a, a situation where there has been no harm caused, where it's not for anybody's benefit, it's hard to see how any you know, prosecutorial authority would take a case, sir. Although we do have a very um, skilled and expensive libel lawyer in Belfast who is particularly favoured by one of the executive parties. I won't name him. He's um, familiar with him. Fairly, I'm sure you are. Um, uh, uh, my final question is, um, is actually about the, the, the two main parties, and I don't want to make it party political, but we do live in a, um, in a situation where we've had two fairly dominant parties here for uh, well, 15 years, really. Um, have you seen... Have you observed anything, again, notwithstanding COVID and the unique circumstances, have you observed any particular, I sort of touched on this earlier on, but have you observed any specific cultural change in how they operate since um, the emergence of the RHI report? 
I think they're more careful in how they operate. I think they're aware that people are looking for these things. Um, there are individuals, John Robinson, Timothy Johnston, others, who were SPADs, who have not returned as SPADs. I think that is an implicit acknowledgement that those people um, were seen as damaged out of this, and therefore people would be looking at them extra carefully. Um, Aidan McAteer does not appear to have returned to his role as a so-called super SPAD. Um, so there was a recognition implicitly that what he was doing was wrong. It was against the law. Um, and so therefore, I think there, there have been limited changes there. But I think that it's a mistake to view this too much through a party political prism. And of course, you will all do that. That's your jobs, your MLAs. But I think that law is about putting something in place that will be in place for potentially decades to come. At the moment, the DUP and Sinn Féin are in power. There's no immediate prospect, um, much to your disappointment of that changing. Um, but it's, it's about the principles of this, whether it's a good thing. And um, I have no experience of, cover, of covering the SDLP and the Ulster Unionists as the lead parties in this place. Was it different? I don't know. So far as you're, uh, I mean, it just this is, this is my final comment slash question. So far as you're aware, um, the, the the people you have named, if this bill was passed tomorrow, those people who were in positions of prominence and power in 2014, 15, 16, um, they would not be captured by this. Um, and um, certainly, there are suggestions that some of those people still are in positions of authority in terms of decision-making structures within those parties, I don't know, but, but, um, but if they are, they wouldn't be caught by this bill. You mean that it wouldn't be retrospective? No, no, mean? I mean, um, uh, well, for this, you mentioned, for example, the person I think is now chief executive of the Democratic mm -hmm. Unionist Party, he wouldn't be captured by no. this bill. I don't know, I'm not, I don't know, if, oh, no. I, don't know no. what, I don't know what the government decisions. employee. Indeed, yeah. and he wouldn't be, um, I don't know what, um, uh, what structures he's involved in now or what, um, what decisions he's involved in taking or consultations, but he wouldn't be captured by this legislation. No, no, and I think there, there is an important principle here that where an individual is paid for by a political party, it's up to the political party within the bounds of the law as to what they do. Um, where they're paid for by the taxpayer, it's very different. Um, if, 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 a, if a party chooses to put somebody in on £92,000 a year as a SPAD, there are certain responsibilities that come with that, and one of those is stringent accountability. But what I'm saying is that... The, one of the findings in your book is that, um, in a sense, in both of these parties, there was um, uh, extra official uh, involvement in decision making, shall we say, people who were not paid for by the taxpayer but who were still involved in decision making, and that seems to have been the case in different ways in both major parties. Um, and if that does persist, I don't know. I'm only back in this place, like everyone's only back in a few months. I'm only moved back to Northern Ireland a few months. But if it does continue, um, then in a sense. It's not captured by this. It wouldn't be captured by this legislation, and that, so that particular bit of that particular flaw, if you like, wouldn't be. I think I've, I think I misunderstood your question, and I think it might be captured in this sense that that actually wasn't Timothy Johnson. Timothy Johnson was a spad during RHI, so he wasn't chief executive. It was Sinn Féin yeah. with Aidan McAteer in this sort of super spad structure that they set up to circumvent the law. And Martin Amelia in this in this chamber was very open as to why they did that. Um, so therefore, I think that would be captured by this on the, on on these grounds. That could only happen when there was secretive channels of communication to those individuals, and Ted Hoyle and Martin Lynch and various other people. Um, that could only happen with the secrecy. So the secrecy is critical here. When you take away the secrecy, um, and this is government business, this is not you know, chatting to them about party business or something else that's not relevant to the department. This is about submissions to the minister, in this case, being sent outside the system to somebody. It's only being done, I think, because they can do it and hide it. If they knew that it was being seen by civil servants and potentially by me in a freedom of information request or by this committee when I asked for papers, it wouldn't be done. Indeed, I have to discuss with Mr. Alistair that there is that clearly that is part of what is targeted by the by the official communications thing. But but there are other um, means of communicating that I that I worry aren't captured. Okay, thanks very much, today. Uh, Jim. Oh, no. Which Jim, clever Jim reflected. Um, I'm not making um, any judgment on that one. Thanks, Sam. Um, so up to now we've had codes, as I put to the human rights people. They haven't exactly excelled in terms of demonstrating their capacity to, to work. If, those, if we put all this into codes, and let's focus on SPADs, and the SPAD breaches that code. The same code makes, gives the exclusive disciplinary power to the minister who appointed him. Does that take us any further down the road of transparency or protecting against the very things which happened in the past? 
Um, so, as I, as I understand what's being done here, um, based on uh, Sue Gray's evidence and Colin Murphy's evidence a couple of weeks ago, it does help us in terms of transparency. So, we do get to see this report. So, if you think of the Stephen Brimstone case, which I think, to the best of my knowledge, was the only time that ever a SPAC yes. got to the disciplinary point. So, fortunately, that's, that's the only one that we can talk about. Um, there, there was a document drawn up, a disciplinary report, which recommended, as I understand it, sanction against them of some sort, and the Minister stopped it. But we didn't even get to see the report. Um, so this moves us on a little bit. There's, there's this sort of baby step where we now get to see the report, and the hope seems to be of the drafters of this that the minister feels compelled by public opinion to suddenly swing in and say, well, actually, it's indefensible. I have to act here. But I suspect that that report largely said what was blindingly obvious to people, that what he had done was inappropriate, and we kind of knew that anyway. So I'm not convinced that that really moves us forward that much if there's no um, sanction or if there's no change to who the decision maker is. So an independent decision maker mm. for disciplinary matters would be very different, I think. And the bill, of course, recommends that they are subject to the Civil Service Disciplinary Code out with the Minister. Um, so if you have a situation where the Minister makes the appointment, he's the pan pick, there's not even a selection panel, there's nothing, and then there is that rapport which might evince itself in a natural inclination to defend that person, and you have that sole authority to decide their fate. It's not exactly confidence building, is it? No. In terms of Clause 11, I've indicated already that I think it's appropriate, having listened to all that's been said, to amend it to import a reasonable excuse defence and a public interest defence, and maybe a provision to make sure that FOI situations are covered to save any action done in the foot of statutory authority. Just explain that to me, sorry. Well, uh, FOIs are answered on the basis of statutory authority, yes. so you wouldn't want anyone to get into trouble for a, okay. producing a document no, in FOI. Yeah. So I might need to put something into that clause to save statutory authority. Yeah. Uh, but other than above that, reasonable excuse and acting in the public interest. Do you think that's, an, that's enough to protect the genuine whistleblower and to protect the legitimate briefing of media? Um, I, th I think it might help to put something in explicitly um, that refers to this does not apply to whistleblowing in the public interest. If, that, if, I, if I'm Misunderstanding you, apologies, because yeah. I'm sort of thinking this yeah. through based on what you said verbally. But um, I think that it's not just about putting this into law so that somebody will not be prosecuted. It's about giving them reassurance that somebody can point it to them and say, look, there it is in black and white. This is not intended to get at you, basically. I think that's very important. Um, a potential chilling effect here is not what anyone intends, I think. But I can see how you know, a junior civil servant looks at this and thinks, well, you know, as, the, as the commissioner said, you know, if there's any chance at all that my liberty is at stake here, why should I do this? And you don't want that sort of impediment to be in the way. Another way of doing it might be to elaborate on what reasonable excuse is. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, for example, in the domestic abuse bill, there's a separate clause defining reasonableness. Mm -hmm. So that would be an option as well. I mean, the, the COVID legislation that we're all far too familiar with at the minute obviously mm. you know, sets out reasonable excuse for exercise, but yes. isn't exhaustive, I so care. it says includes. Um, uh, maybe that's a way to do it, you know, so that it ca captures some of these ex exemplary. Um, but I think it would be difficult to perhaps capture them all. I mean, I'm a journalist, so I have a particular reason to think about these things. There will be other people who might not even know that this is going on. Um, and so, therefore, if it's, if it's left like that, I think it gives some discretion to the prosecutorial authorities and to the judge as to whether this is reasonable. Um, and I think that in the cases that we're thinking about here, the extreme cases, clearly they're not reasonable. So, you know, I, I don't think that really nullifies any of the intent of the bill, but it builds in a bit of a safeguard there for potential unintended consequences. Yeah, fair enough. Um, it was suggested earlier today that uh, what, new, what criminality is captured by Clause 11 that isn't already criminal. Presumably the distribution by a SPAD of confidential documents to his family was not a criminal offence. 
you will know more about the law on this than I will, but my, my, my understanding of the Official Secrets Act is that it's much more targeted towards national security yeah. and um, the, uh, the defence of the nation. Well, and so take it from me, there's nothing in the Official yeah. Secrets Act that would yeah. help you in that situation. Yeah. So I, th I, I think, I think it, it is a breach of the terms of the civil service um, rulebook, and, um, but yet again we oh. hear at the RHI inquiry within the civil service, not just SPADs, but the culture was so wide that within the civil service, up to and including uh, permanent secretaries, they were forwarding to their own private hotmail accounts or whatever it was, do confidential government documents, mm -hmm. so they could read them on a bigger screen at points. So Oops. that, in, te in technical terms, within the civil service rules, that was a potential dismissal offence, gross misconduct. Nobody was ever sacked for it, yeah. to the best of my knowledge. And so therefore, I think you, you've, you've got this sort of um, uh, contradiction between what on paper is, a, is quite a tough sanction that recognises these things are problematic, not just for the reasons we're discussing, but for information security reasons that they could be hacked, the Hillary Clinton emails, um, open to commercial interests, hacking them for commercial gain, um, all sorts of things. But if those aren't enforced, they're meaningless. Yeah. Okay. Your idea that the civil service could go into a special advisor's private emails to check something out, there would be horrendous data protection issues there, would there not? There would, and so therefore, and again, I will defer to, um, to you and to lawyers on the uh, drafting of this, but I think that it is possible to put this into, into, into terms where it is very restrictive, so it makes clear that there has to be a reasonable belief, an expectation that this yes. information exists. You, you, you can't just go to a SPAD's email account and start fishing around in the hope that there might be a government document. You have to have reason to believe that it is there. Um, so, for instance, in, in the example that I gave of Moy Park and Andrew Crawford, why I'd asked for documents, we know they existed. We know that he used this account. There's, there's no debate about that. And yet we're told that it's not in the public interest and there is no mechanism whereby the department, having facilitated this practice by forwarding things to this account for the SPAD, knowingly, knowingly keeping it off the system, um, that they can go in and get that. I think that, that is so perverse, it's so insecure in terms of the security of those individuals' data protection rights, um, that there has to be some deterrent to that. And so therefore, um, in the presence of the SPAD, under proper authority, I think there has to be a way that that at least can be um, tested, or some other means found of stopping that, whereby it's made clear that it's not a retrospective thing in the sense that this happens now to people who didn't know that would be the case, but SPADs are told openly now, if you do this in future, if you choose to use a private email account, this is what will happen. You're doing it with your eyes open, and so therefore it's your choice. So to restrict the power, say, to a permanent secretary on reasonable suspicion mm -hmm. would be something of a safeguard. Okay. Maybe, maybe there could be a role there for the Information Commissioner. I mean, ultimately, mm. this is a, a freedom of information issue, and it seems to me that the, the I mean, the, the, there's case law on this from the, um, uh, from the, uh, the Information Tribunal with Michael Gove's spads. I think actually Dominic Cummings was one of them at that point, where they tried to do this, and the Information Tribunal ruled that you could not use government emails in this way, and um, so therefore there is there is um, there is case law there around that. Thank you. Very quick one, Matthew. A very, very quick one. I'm sticking Long my phone. I'm finding loads of um, things that, I'm probably, that are, would be prosecutable, probably things where I had forwarded bits of it from my old job that are in my Hotmail account. Don't you think there's a risk that ordinary civil servants who are, um, that you have a chilling effect on public administration? One of the things that came out in your book is a capacity question, a caliber question, frankly, in relation to the Northern Ireland Civil Service and our broader political class here. Don't you think that there is a, a risk of creating a chilling effect if it is seen to be um, a, well, first of all, uh, the Human Rights Commission talked about it, the, the, the potential of a criminal sanction or loss of liberty for getting on the wrong side um, of this, even if, you, even if there is a reasonableness excuse or a, um, uh, a, you know, a, um, a, a fair defense of one kind or another. And don't you think you create a chilling effect or are, um, I guess for our civil service and our public life here, which your book seems to acknowledge, is already uh, a little bit under par. Um, I suppose I would turn that round and ask, why would a civil servant need to use a Hotmail account? And I'm, I'm, I'm not being facetious, I'm being genuine. <coughs> what sort of circumstances so, would that be appropriate? So the, the circumstances in which, it, in which it's appropriate are literally as 
um, mundane as having an official device which has died and you are moving around and you happen to need a bit of information uh, on another device. So you, you, or for example, knowing that you need a bit of information and you can't get to your official email, so you, from your own, uh, from your from your work email, you send it to Hotmail or Gmail in order to access it later. I would say 99.999% of civil service use of personal email will be um, affected by that. So my question is not so much that you can't draw a, a, a defence, and, 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 and Jim has talked about that there would be a defence for that, um, but the very fact of there being a criminal sanction for it creates a chilling effect for people and actually makes it in a sense, even harder for us to get, frankly, younger, better people into the Northern Ireland Civil Service? I think two, two things help to um, mitigate against that. And one, one is the public interest aspect of this. So is it, is it in the public interest? Is there, is there a difficulty? So clearly, I think what you've outlined is in the public interest. You're a civil servant. You're doing a job. Your phone's died, so you forward it to this. Um, and if, if there is this provision for retrospectively informing the department and Again, it's a decision as to what threshold that should be at. Should it be that there is a threshold whereby over a certain classification of a document, you say this, this applies and routine stuff about a, you know, a minister's meeting or something is, is not that important? Yeah. Um, or maybe you think that is that important. But I mean, I think there are, there are ways of dealing with that um, which still recognise that this should be really frowned upon very severely. It is frowned upon in the Civil Service Handbook. It is very clear that this is, up, this is a, uh, a disciplinary um, matter up to the level of gross misconduct because it's about data security, it's about individuals' data that you're forwarding. You know, there may be good reasons to do that in extremists, but it really should be, I think... Um, I mean, I've got a newsletter um, email account, I've got my own, you know, whatever it is, Google account or whatever it is. Um, overwhelmingly, I use my newsletter account. You know, it comes to my phone, it comes to my laptop. Um, I don't see a great difficulty there. Yes, now and again, you might forward something to another account to print a document or something, but I don't think that's a great burden on civil servants, given the scale of the problem here. You think I got out then? I'm, um, I, I'm not sure if I can be re retrospectively prosecuted. Into this. I think, I think the answer is saying I wasn't going to uh, interrupt, but I think the answer is probably bigger batteries. Paul. Yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, just on that point, uh, and I get Sam, what you say about, you know, you always keep your phone charged, you always have an hour device with you, and you don't see it being a massive problem. But have you ever sent an email from your phone when you have two accounts on your phone, and by mistake, you've sent it using the wrong account? I don't have two accounts. So... so even, you know, you, you don't want to end up making an offence when it's a mistake. Now, again, I have, I have concerns around Clause 9, but, but I, I do think that if that was to happen, because I've done it, my staff tell me off all the time about sending an email from my phone and it's bounced from another, uh, from, my, from my private account, because that's maybe the last email I sent. And so when you type in somebody's email address, you put in the content and you hit send, oh, crikey, you realise I've sent that. So... It can happen by mistake very quickly when you've got multiple email addresses in your device. It, it may then be a reasonable excuse to say, Craig, I've made this mistake. I will now forward that email on to my uh, business account, my job account, and also send it to my line manager to say this happened, this breach happened. And I, I think that's quite reasonable uh, because it's... Where you're coming from, and I get it, is all about secrecy. Uh, and I'm there with you uh, on this, uh, on that page. Uh, Matthew asked you a question about. Uh, I suppose I, I'll, I'll let you answer that with regards to the mistake happening. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts? That's on that? not, I mean, I think, like, I mean, clearly, that's. I mean, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't. As, a, as somebody in the private sector, I don't work in a terribly bureaucratic organisation. Some, sometimes it can feel that way with the owners in England. Um, but uh, I mean, I don't want to, you know, see a situation like that. We've far too much bureaucracy as it is in many cases. This is not about bureaucracy. This is about common sense. These these were not situations where people inadvertently used the wrong account. I don't think anybody even really suggested that. There has to be a reasonableness aspect to this, and I think the the retrospective period, and maybe it should be quite generous. Maybe it should be a month. 
and say, you know, you, you've got this period to put it right. Um, and even then, if you don't, there is the test of the public interest. Is it in the public interest to prosecute you for it? It may well be that actually you just forgot about it even after the month, but that, that it's judged that there was no benefit to you, there was nothing improper about it. If the email, I think, I think it will, in, in many of these instances, it will be pretty obvious from the, the content of the email. Let's give an example of forwarding documents to a family member. Right? I mean, it's pretty obvious there that if you have used a private account to do that, you haven't informed your manager after a month. Um, that I think a reasonable person and a judge would look at that in the terms of this legislation and say, you didn't do that out of a mistake. The onus is on you to explain why you did it. And so therefore, you know, yes, there, there, there will be extreme cases here which I think have to be captured by the, the reasonableness, the public interest and then some of the defences. But um, that's the exception, I think, rather than the rule of what's involved here. Matthew, you asked your question about culture <laughs> and your experience of, of change, if there is one. Um, again, my experience, I don't see much culture change. I have a sit in this committee whereby the department and the minister, by letter, is refusing to disclose emails. We'll be talking about that later in correspondence if you want to hang about. Uh, we have a justice department <coughs> who won't tell their, that committee about £39 million pounds of a bid. Uh, and we've still departments, Department of the Economy, one of them, not answering questions, answer your questions. So there is this, this, still this accountability issue, this, this public interest confidence issue uh, that still needs to be addressed. So, you know, do we need reform? The answer to that is absolutely yes. It's the method and the travel of reform is the question. Uh, your, your, your suggestions for, cl for clauses, uh, number one, reasonable enough for a journalist to, to come up with that. Can I just say, number two scares the bedevils out of me. It really does. Because I, I think, given what we've talked about with regards to a mistake happening and device, to, to think that a civil service at any, of any hue, of any level, can actually rack through somebody's personal email, personal baggage, personal life, uh, sounds horrendous. Uh, because... If you're having to check, if there is a reasonable suspicion that someone has sent something by a personal device or, or email, you, you, there's no way of of, of determining or, or or shortening that search. When you go into somebody's email, you have it all. You have it guts and all, and that scares. That really does scare me that a government government official can actually get into a human being's life like that and look in. Now, they're maybe looking for a certain thing, but they're going to have to look at all. And that really does scare me. So I'm really, really worried and nervous about that suggestion. I really am. What's your thoughts about... <coughs> well, I, can, I think any human being would be rather nervous of somebody rifling through your email account, and I'm not suggesting that anything improper is in anyone's email accounts. Um, but, I mean, the, the nature of it is that it's personal, it's private. You know, it's like going through somebody's diary. Um, it's, not, it's not something that any of us would um, relish. And so, therefore, I think, um, first of all, it can be curtailed a bit, so it's not as simple as they go in there and they see everything. You can search, so you can go into an email account and search for RHI plus Moy Park. And so, you know, that, that was what I was asking for. I mean, I have no interest in, you know, what else might be in there, and I have no idea what else might be in there. Um, I had a very specific request, and I'd asked for them to search for these specific terms. So it can be done like that. It can be done in the presence of the individual, so they can see that there's no improper, you know, activity of somebody going beyond their remit as a civil servant. Um, but I think that it's meant to scare them. That's the point of it. It's meant to be a deterrent. But and so it's, it's, so sorry, just if, if I could say this very quickly, it's, it's a choice by the individual to use that account for government business. Once they do that, they open themselves up to this. And if they don't, how else do we stop them doing it? But, but is, the clause in a statu is the clause in statute not enough of a deterrent with a, with a, with a penalty and a tariff? Is, is, it, is that not enough? Um, yeah, is that not enough? So two, two points on that. First of all, I think partially this, this is sort of suggested in terms where this gets rejected. So people say it shouldn't be a criminal offence. That's, that's disproportionate. So this is, um, you're, you're not going to go to jail. It's going to be a bit embarrassing. It's going to be a bit awkward, you know, but it's nowhere near the threshold of going to jail for this. 
And secondly, I think that even if the other clause does stay in this bill, and, and there is still the criminal sanction, that just deals with where we get to know about this. How do we get to know about it? That's the key element of this. We know about these emails because of the RHI inquiry. We wouldn't have known that Marching Amelia used um, marching at newbelfast.com um, for, all, for his seems like most, if not all, of his government business, etc., etc., and throughout this, Jonathan Bell, 620 at hotmail.com. I mean, you know, it's, it's ludicrous, but we only know about this because we got access to it. How do we get access to it? I'm trying to address that issue here. We get access to it through FOI in proportionate terms where it's not, you know, a journalist doing this, it's an independent person. Um, and, yes, clearly these, these issues have to be looked at in terms of proportionality, data protection, human rights... But if it's not this way, how else do you stop a SPAD simply saying, or a civil servant, this is something that's inappropriate. I know it's inappropriate. I'm not putting it in my government account. I'm using the Gmail account. I see nothing at the moment to stop them doing that. Why would you suggest that it's a civil service who should conduct that search and not a scrutiny committee? That's a good question. We, we, have, we, have, we have powers to compel. So when we ask the question of a, an official, a minister, a permanent secretary, and we ask the question, we want to see all emails around RHA or around PPE or, or around uh, a certain policy. When we ask for them all, we expect them all, uh, no matter what account they're from, no matter who sent what to who, we want to see all those exchanges. So when we ask for all, we expect all. Yep. And okay, it's hard knowing the unknowns, and I get that point. But that's where we end up having to troll through exchanges after exchanges to say, well, look, here's a gap. Here's a couple of days where there's been no exchanges. An email. That's really strange. So we ask the question. Was there no emails those days? And the answer is yes, there was, but they're very Monday, and you'll not want to see them, so we're not sending them. Um, so, so should, should it not be, if there was such a clause, and that scares me, but if there was such a clause, should it not be a scrutiny committee? So two, two things in response to that. First of all, I don't think scrutiny committees need that power, because I think they have that power. Um, and one of my disappointments with scrutiny committees in this place, and I think scrutiny committees in this place represent the best of this institution, um, where the best work goes on, um, and often, you know, Based on my trade, I think it, you know, it doesn't get reported um, as, as widely as it should do, but I mean, that's, that's, that's the nature of the, the constraints in our industry. Um, but I think that one of my disappointments with, with committees here is that they have never once, and the, the clerk might know more, more about this than I do, but to the best of my ability to be able to ascertain this from the Assembly authorities, no committee since 1998 has ever forced somebody to either attend or bring documents to, this, to a committee. Now, they've beaten their chests about it. Um, Dathy Mackay did it rightly over the NAMA stuff, um, as did other members of that committee, uh, or th this, this committee as it then was, um, but they've always backed down for various reasons. There may be good reasons in, in individual circumstances, but they have incredible powers. They, ha they seem to me in law to have most of the powers that the public inquiry had, but they just don't use them. Um, they could bring SPADs here. They could ask SPADs to turn over their emails and WhatsApps. Um, so that does exist. However, I think there is a potential that that does exist and it's there as part of the democratic process. But I think there is a difficulty in this legislation in turning that over to a political body. I think that the benefits of the civil service, as flawed as the civil service is, is that it's not political, it's not partisan. So you're all incentivised in political directions and it can very quickly descend into, you know, um, not, not just that you could be asking, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not looking at anybody in particular, but I mean, not, not just that MLA X could be asking for something for a party political motive, but the person who's sitting here refusing to hand that over throws back at them, you're only doing this because you don't like my party. You can't do that as easily with a civil servant. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Paul. Chairman? Thanks. Um, this might have been covered, um, but just just um, ask you, what's the basis for your assertion that it should be a criminal offence to give um, government information out as a SPAD? To give it, what is your assertion on that basis? I'm not sure that I have asserted that. Okay. So, I mean, I, I've, I've said in my written evidence, and I, I think in what I said at the start of this, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that it's not for me to say whether this bill is the correct way or the proportionate way of dealing with this. Um, I, think the print, the, I think the intent of this bill, most people agree, is right. The debate is over whether this bill is the appropriate way to do it, and the clauses as they are are appropriate, or they need amended or added to, or whether a code should do that. Um, should it be a criminal offence? That's for you to decide. Okay, and you have read the codes that 
the yes. Minister? Oh, yes, yes. Okay. I mean, I've, I've spoken to the people who were involved in um, drafting them, and um, I see nothing. And I mean, I, I listened very carefully to the Minister's evidence and to Sue Gray's evidence, and ultimately, I, I forget who it was asked this question. I think it might have been Matthew or perhaps um, Jim Wells, I think, or maybe both of you. Um, uh, as to what ultimately happens if a SPAD has to be disciplined and the Minister says, no, I'm not doing it, um, as has happened in the past, and essentially the answer is, well, that's up to them. So, I mean, how, how does that move us forward? How does that deal with bad behaviour? And do you have a suggestion as to what that could be? If you're as, saying... to how to, as to how to deal with that? Yeah. Well, I think there, there has to be some tough sanction. So, is it, is it criminal? Um, is it in terms of this suggestion around um, looking in private email accounts? Um, it, is, it, is it something that they fear? Is it losing salary? Is it um, being demoted in the salary scale? Is it being fined? I think there is, not, there is no reason that I can see here that anyone would have any fear of doing these things, particularly if the minister said to you, I'm OK with it. OK. Correct me if I'm wrong, but... Well, I'm not a spad, so I don't know. I'm not a minister either. That's right. That's grand, yeah, thanks. That's... Oh, you will be one day, Gemma. I hope not. <laughs> Jim. Yes, Jim. Um, ben, you were quite charitable about the incident uh, involving uh, Simon Hamilton and John Robinson uh, and leaking material. I assume you do get material leaked to you regularly as a journalist. Of course. Uh, and you may actually make use of some of that material at times. Yep. Now, um, do you honestly believe that that disgraceful incident was being done in order to, as a whistleblowing exercise, in order to protect the department? No, no, no. Why do you and think it was done? So, I mean, it, it was very clearly done um, at least to protect the party. That's the, the sort of public position of um, Simon Hamilton and I think to, to a certain extent John Robinson. Um, my analysis of it is that actually when you look at the timeline and you look at what's involved, it was not to protect the party. Um, John Robinson had these documents for about a month. Richard Bullock was putting pressure on him to release them to the media. Couldn't understand from his evidence to the inquiry why this hadn't been done. Um, and then suddenly, I think it was, was it three days, two, three days after John Robinson's father-in-law uh, is revealed to be a boiler claimant? Um, or a, an RHI claimant has a, has a boiler. No suggestion he's done anything wrong, but there's a bit of pressure on John as to why he hasn't revealed this. He hasn't declared a conflict of interest. And there's a lot of internal pressure on him in the party. MLAs who had gone out um, had defended him on the basis of his statement of a couple of days earlier that he had no links to this. His family had no links to RHI. Suddenly it turns out that's not quite the whole story. And this lands on my desk at that precise moment. Was that about protecting the party or was that about protecting him? But what, what I'm saying is that even though his motives there seem to me very clearly to be impure or to be um, complicated, um, I don't think that should necessarily be a criminal offence because there was some public good in what he did. What was the public good? The public good was exposing that civil servants had been briefing all around them to the industry and that had helped to drive the spike. So it was, it was twofold. So partly the spike was driven by Andrew Crawford and various other individuals, Tim Kearns involved in delaying cost controls. And that was in tandem with the fact that the industry was just being leaked to like a sieve from within the department. So that's, we, we, we did not know that at that point. So that moved things on very significantly. Yeah, it, the public good was to you as a journalist because you had a front page scoop. Well, I mean, uh, which, which you, you relentlessly used, as you know. That wasn't, that wasn't the public good. That, that, was, that was personal good, I suppose, but, um, or good for my employer. But there, there was public good in knowing that civil servants who are paid by taxpayers had been acting in this way. And there was a second reason why that was important. Andrew McCormick, the day before, as the Permanent Secretary, I think in this seat, um, uh, yes, it was, in, in, at the Public Accounts Committee, had named Andrew Crawford as the person who he had been told had delayed cost controls in 2015. And he said that he had done that on the basis of hearsay. He had no evidence of it, but he thought that had happened. As soon as we got these emails and we went to the department and said, we're going to name these individuals, this is what they've done, it's not disputed that they acted in this way, they threatened to injunct us, using public money to stop these people being named, even though there was no suggestion that this was hearsay, this was fact. So there were differential standards being applied to SPADs who were being treated very robustly, and based on flimsy evidence they were being named. We now know that that evidence was largely correct, but that's, that's retrospectively. At the time, the civil service was applying a different standard to itself as it was to DUP SPADs, and I don't think that was fair. And would you have taken the same view if you had not uh, earned vast numbers of brownie points by publishing that leaked material? Is Absolutely. It, is that, in other words, you don't want to do anything that would damage further leaks uh, from departments to you? Not, not, not in any way, of course not. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a journalist and my, my interest in that is very open, I suppose. But um, I think that if you, if you look at this, I suppose what, what I'm trying to draw out of this example is that we shouldn't look at someone and think, um, do I not like what they did in this instance? Do I not like them? Do I not like their party? Or whatever it might be, 
Was there any public good? If, there is, if the answer to that is yes, there's any public good, no matter what else went on, I think we should err on the side of saying that's OK. So it doesn't matter how reckless you are. It doesn't matter how underhand what you're doing, as long as there's some public good because a journalist gets a scoop. So the nature of, I mean, it's not about a journalist getting a scoop. It's about the story entering the public domain. It's about the public's right to know what, what the people they pay and they employ are doing in their name um, and holding them to account. Um, let's not forget that no civil servant has been disciplined for RHI. Many of them have been promoted, including Stuart Whiteman, who was one of the individuals involved in those leaks. Now, I mean, all of that only comes because we get these, um, and I mean, leaks um, are by very nature, if you want to use the pejorative term, underhand. That's the nature. They're confidential. They have to be. Um, and, uh, you know. Yeah. But there's also a whistleblowing uh, policy within the civil service that if you have a concern, you bring it to your line manager first, you exhaust all remedies, and if you still feel it's in the public interest to leak, then you do. Yeah. Now, that clearly didn't happen in this instance. It, well, it, 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 it partially happened in the sense that John sent these to Andrew McCormick before he sent them to me a few weeks, but he certainly didn't wait for the conclusion of, a, of an investigation. I'm not seeking to claim that he acted in anything other than um, personal attempts to deflect blame from himself. Of course he did. Um, but I'm saying that you know, we, we should be cautious about criminalising that. And secondly, Fiona, um, not, not uh, Fiona Hepper, uh, Jeanette O'Hagan, the whistleblower who initially came to Arlene Foster, um, went through all those channels. She went through the department, albeit she didn't describe herself as a whistleblower blower but in every other um, instance she was she was in that category and she retrospectively said my big regret here is looking back on this I didn't just go to the media because that would have when when I, when I went to the media that's when things really started to happen look I've got a vested interest in this you all know that I'm a journalist but I think that that public accountability is healthy in the system yes but also remember it was an attempt to put the blame on a civil servant a senior civil servant and, and could it could have sunk him uh, and it ruined his career. Uh, so, is that not? Well, it didn't ruin his career. He's been promoted. <laughs> yes, he did. But it could have been very damaging. Your article could that have would... been extremely damaging to him. Well, we were, we were very fair to him. We waited seven days before naming him. Um, we ran the story the next day saying that civil servants had been involved in leaking. We then waited seven days. We took legal advice. We repeatedly went back and asked for his side of the story. He declined to give it. That's his prerogative. Um, but I'm sorry, if you're paid from public funds, at a very, he's, he, he's paid a bigger salary than I am. He's trusted by government to come and brief committees and give them information about legislation. Um, if he can't be accountable, I think there's a difficulty in the system. Well, and you're saying... Having looked at all that, there shouldn't have been any criminal sanction taken in that situation. On the basis of this law, in terms of the whistleblowing aspects of it, I, I don't think so. I mean, that's my personal opinion. Other people, I, I can understand that somebody from the civil service unions would come here and say, look, that's appalling. It's the wrong way to do things. I understand that. I'm just saying that we should be careful about looking at hard cases and thinking that's always necessarily entirely wrong. It might be partially wrong. Is it wholly wrong? I think there was some public good out of that. Thanks, sir. Right, sorry, Chair. Sorry. Thanks, Thanks very much. much. Okay, can I just make one wee point? Sorry, just, I really think we're having like a rerun of the RHI inquiry here. Good idea. I think that it should be much more focused, mm -hmm. uh, and I think we should deal with it in, in relation to the, um, the legislation that has been presented to the press time. In fact, that was what it was meant to be about. Yep. Thanks, Pat. Sure, Noted. thanks. Pat. I'll, I'll let you go. Sam, thank you. Um, I, for one, will defend the freedom of the press as best as I possibly can, and well done, and I'm glad you are here. Thank you. Uh, for it. Sam, I come, I'm coming what you said earlier on from, that, from the private sector. I found very late on in life in Lagan Valley, I found myself elected to the chamber, and the first role that was given to me was on the programme for government when I come in here. So that was after three years of doing nothing. And there are some members here, and t to me it filled me with such great hope you know, I really thought that I was coming into something, but after, well, you know, I read, you know, with reading your book and with listening to your evidence here today, I mean, there are good, you've already stated, special advisors who operate to the best and the highest of standards. We wouldn't be allowed to operate like that in the private sector. We'd be lynched and run out of the place. Yet, it seems to be that they can, things have happened here, and with what's coming through on this bill, I mean, we need accountability here. We need it strengthened. And I, I, I look at what the two clauses that come into it. 
uh, see that they've gone now, the human rights that, that were there as well. What about the rights of all of those electorates? What about the spend and the money and the taxes that you work for morning, noon and night in order to see that this is all fulfilled here? So there has to be honesty. How do, we, how do you, from the private sector, install trust back into here again? I mean, I have... I'm, I'm not going on as, a, as, as, as a, I want here to work. I want Northern Ireland to work. I have put the best part of my life to try and to grow an economy here as best as I can and give people jobs. I see here like we have eight advisors. They only use six in the TO office. I mean, it's the, the spend and the waste of money drives me insane. But I'm prepared to go along with it, provided it's honest and fair and above board. It's not. It doesn't seem to be either, from what I've heard here today. How do you see this change, and how can we change it? So, just I mean, on the on the, on the point about good spads, I think I think it's important to say that, and we all know that. We all know good spads, and we know people who, who have done their jobs conscientiously. I think that it'd be a mistake to look at this as a as a as a as an attempt to. I mean, I, I'm not speaking for, for the intent of the proposer, but um, from, from looking at the wording of this, it would be a mistake to look at this and think that this is some sort of an anti-SPAD attempt to get at SPADs, get at civil servants. One of the things that always astounded me about this place was the short-termism. So the, 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 the way in which, particularly the DUP and Sinn Féin, and I'm saying that because those were the two lead parties, they were the dominant parties, they had the power, the other parties didn't, and so therefore um, maybe if it was different, other people would have acted differently, I can't say. But based on <laughs> where we were, those two parties acted with incredible, um, with, with, with gay abandon, you know, just there, there was no sense of, of, of looking at the situation and saying, will we still be here in 15 years' time? It was a case of, um, can we get through this crisis? Um, you know, threats to the media behind closed doors about government advertising being pulled if we didn't act in certain ways, all sorts of behaviour that's reprehensible. And rather than look at um, public confidence in this place and say, actually, we want to nurture this, we want to get people on side with us and say, we're actually working for you. We got to a situation where, as I said, when Stormont fell for three years, nobody really cared until the point that people were literally dying in hospitals. And that was the thing that people said, well, we don't really like Stormont, but we kind of need it back because people are dying and there's no alternative. I mean, what on earth does that say about this place? And yet, there, I, I don't really grasp a sense from some of the evidence to this committee from the minister and from others that um, they really get the significance of the public anger at this, that they're sort of you know, dabbling around the edges of this. There's no ultimate sanction here for people who step out of line. Thanks, Chair. At the outset, Sam, you said that the issue here to be addressed was a cultural issue around integrity and that. And I think you've, you've named a, a host of people, and you did say about Sinn Féin, but I think the criticism of Sinn Féin was about how they employed their uh, spads. But um, I asked Sue Gray, and she said, and she's no shrink and violent in, in terms of uh, tackling these people, she said that the codes here were stronger than anywhere else in these islands. Do you agree with her? Um, she's in a better position to comment on that than I am. Um, however, I would say this. Um, she comes from the Cabinet Office, um, obviously, and um, that's her background. The Cabinet Office at the moment um, seems to be pretty toothless in terms of dealing with Mr Cummings. And so therefore, do we look at London and say that it's good enough that simply the Prime Minister decides, regardless of anything else, as to whether a SPAD, in this case, allegedly has broken the law, not just you know, behave badly, has literally broken the law? We're, we're, we're told by people um, who, have, uh, who, who, who have looked at this in some detail. Um, is that, is that enough? And I think the second element of this is that there are particular circumstances here. Um, London, Dublin, Cardiff, Edinburgh, they haven't had RHI scandals. They, they haven't had these specific practices. So this is a response to, to particular circumstances, and so therefore I'm not entirely clear that, um, it's, that, it, that it helps us that much by comparing us to you know, London, Dublin, Washington, anywhere else. These are particular difficulties that we have in this place. Yeah, uh, that's fine, chat. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Yeah. Sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, thank you, Rose. Uh, you, Sam. Um, when you sat down, you initially had said that it wasn't your position whether or not we should have a code of conduct or whether it should be sort of a, a statutory legislation in relation to the SPADs and so on. Well, you're doing a good job in a way of uh, arguing for the statutory legislation and things like that. Um, and I have to be honest too that uh, some of the language that you'd actually used, you know, and if you were describing uh, Aidan uh, McAteer and the likes of it as well, too, has been super SPAD and so on. That's in your opinion. And I've listened quite a bit well, to it. Well, it's based on the evidence. Uh, the I, I think that's unfair. I'm sorry, Chair. 
Well, that's all. Uh, just three, 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 and uh, as I say, I read it in your book, and that as well, too, uh, that type of criticism, and that of him, not only of him, but even of other party members as well, too. But that, you know, you're very, very good at giving those opinions in that respect. But I'd nearly go a stage further and would say to you then, um, would you give an opinion then, we'll say, on uh, the extent of what wasn't described as corruption, and you were surprised that that wasn't uh, how it was described by the I, did, I didn't inquiry. say that. I didn't say that. But you, you, you were, I was we, surprised at the inquiry. I didn't say I was surprised at that finding. Yeah, you, you, were, you were surprised at the inquiry and that they didn't find that was we'll say as such, right? So that um, I, I just find that you know that and painting the picture here uh, again too is more more or less nearly implied that you had two of the larger parties when there was no opposition. Now, uh, is that correct? Is that factually correct that there was no opposition? For most fact, of the time, prior, yes. prior to the, the, the Assembly coming down, I thought that fact there was an opposition. For a few months. But yeah, well, there, there was an opposition, in other words. So, therefore, to say there was no opposition is not correct. Oh, at overwhelmingly, time, it was the at case. At the time, there was an opposition in that there, right? And at the same time, too, even then, uh, for you to describe this just as the two big parties, as almost implying that they were equally culpable for what have been identified nearly, if anything else, those situations uh, that were, one might have thought there could have been corruption, i.e. whether it was RHA or um, uh, NAMA or uh, in terms of... Uh, Tiff. Sorry? Tiff. Yeah, well, you know, all of these here is what you're actually implying there. And I don't think that they were equally culpable in that respect. I'd have thought that, that uh, they carried different responsibilities entirely there. Uh, and I just would like to make that statement to you in the sense that uh, uh, then uh, to say to you then, whilst you said from the outset that you didn't think that uh, it was your role to uh, suggest whether it should be stacked there or otherwise, but you've gone a, half, a hell of a long way in actually doing that. I think, so. I think, I think you've, you've fundamentally misunderstood what I've said, Mr McHugh. Um, I, I said that it's not my role to say whether we should support this, whether you should support this bill. That is a matter for you as legislators, and I'm not taking any position on that whatsoever. Um, what, what I am saying is that there has to be some tough sanction. I'm not saying this is the tough sanction. I'm saying that the code as drafted is toothless. Now, convince me if, I'm, if, if, if I've got that wrong. If there's some incredibly big carrot um, and stick that is hanging over spads here, if they, if, they, if they do what they were doing beforehand. But based on the minister's evidence, it seems that ultimately, if the minister decides nothing's going to happen to a spad, so what? That's it. Let's move on. Nothing can be done. Well, just even on that point as well, too, that uh, you did accept that we have moved forward in terms of the code. Uh, and that, That's and not saying very much, though. You said not very much, quite right. But I do think it's significant the very fact that the minister and himself has said that the book stops with the minister, unlike what it was that we were confronted with at that time. It always time. has. There's no difference there. No, no. Well, it wasn't always the case. It was very, very obviously not the case. Well, it was very obviously very obviously not the case when, in fact, we were dancing on the head of a pin about whether one had the authority and what the authority, whether or not they had responsibility. Which is already in Foster. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly what right. Would, what would now, stop so that? Therefore, what what would, I'm, sorry, okay. can uh, I just sorry, finish sorry, the point that I'm making to you? Sam, sorry, I, 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 I was just, just sorry. If I, if, if I could ask Mr. McHugh just um, to, to, to fully understand this point. So, what would stop Arlene Foster behaving as she did, based on this code? Uh, I think that, in fact, the, uh, the statement that I had made uh, and t previously that when one looks at the code in itself, it's not that the code per se is the problem. It's the culture, and that's what has to change. We we'll say within parties of the likes of it as well, too, i.e. that culture that whereby people are not looking how to circumvent a code one way or the other. But I do think that the code, as, it's constantly, uh, as it is now constituted, has been strengthened. Uh, and that, it doesn't uh, stop her doing that. But at the same time, and I also do think too, that irrespective of whether you have it as statutory or in a code form, that if you have people that are determined to say to undermine or to circumvent, they'll probably still go ahead and, and do that as well too, uh, in, in, in every way. Uh, and I think I made that point earlier on as well. So. At some peril to themselves, though, if they if they breach the terms of what's proposed here. Um, I think just one one other thing, um, which you which you said uh, in, in terms of what I'd said about Aidan McAteer. Um, I mean, 
there is nothing of my opinion in this. Um, this is based on evidence to the RHI inquiry from Martin O'Melier, who was his, um, who was the Sinn Féin minister giving evidence to the inquiry. He was very clear, not just as to what happened in terms of his appointment being outside the law, so Sinn Féin saw itself as being above the law, quite literally above the law, um, but he, he was very clear as to the intent of that. The intent was that he would continue in his role as if nothing had happened. So that's not, those aren't my words. Those are the words. That, that is the evidence um, of a Sinn Féin minister, and I mean, I, I don't see why I should dispute that. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. So, thank you very much indeed for your thank evidence. You. Uh, if we have any further written evidence that comes from some of the discussions, have, could we forward that to you? Yep. I could respond that to the committee. And, sir, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you for thank your you. time. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, if we move on to, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we move on to item number six: written evidence, functioning of government miscellaneous provisions bill. I'd like to draw the members' attention to the following papers relating to the agenda item: uh, the response of the department clarifying the time limit that is referred to in the revised Northern Ireland Civil Code of Ethics relating to raising a matter for consideration by the Civil Service Commissioner. It's on page 40. Response to Mr. Allister from the Department of Justice on page 41. The Committee for the Executive Office Bill Timetable and Written Submission on the Bill, page 45, and the Hansard Report from the Evidence Sessions with David Sterling, Head of the Civil Service. Um, are we any commentary? Could I say the reply from the Permanent Secretary? Totally recasts his original letter, and it's quite clear that they now accept that they are barking up the wrong tree when talking about Section 5 of the Secretary's Act. And I welcome that. Mm, thank you. Any other comments? Uh, advise the members of the Committee for the Executive Office has indicated that it will respond to the Committee by the 3rd of July. Yep. Uh, I want to advise members on uh, an updated electronic bill folder, which includes the above written evidence was issued to members yesterday. Is everybody working? Yes. Uh, Jim, did you say you were having a problem with it? No, no, not now. Many, <laughs> many attempts, but it's, it's, it got there in the end. Yeah. You switched the computer on. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Okay. Can, can, I say, can I just say on that? That's a technical point that might be for after. But I can get my bill folder up on the Firefox, you know, my basic internet section. I haven't been able to get it up yet on my, along with my other. But if packs, I'm wondering. It, is that should that be the case? If it is, I'll search again. But at the minute, it's through Firefox. It's through the, the search engine. Yeah, well, can we take this uh, out at yeah, the yeah, end, sure. end right of the time. committee, just in case we get onto private emails on your Hotmail account? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If we move on to item number seven on the agenda, financial support for businesses adversely affected by COVID-19. I'd like to draw your attention to the following papers: the clerk's brief on gaps in COVID-19 funding, tabled at page five. Emails from committee members in response to the matter tabled at page 7. Correspondence from the Committee for the Economy regarding the executive response to the pandemic impact on the business sector, accompanied by a letter from Debenhams on page 69. And the correspondence from the Committee for the Economy to the Minister of Finance regarding support for sole traders. Members, do we have any comment? Yes, Mr Chairman. Uh, I, I did make a response. Uh, to, to the troll for additional information on this. I understand that um, the Minister for the Economy has stated that to accede to our request to allow sole traders would cost £890 million, which is a slight technical problem, um, uh, actually delivering on that. But I still think there must be some um, help for that group with maybe quite strict criteria as to who, who would get it. The other issue that I said was that not-for-profit charitable organisations should not be excluded because they can apply to the charity uh, fund uh, for the Department of Communities, but the grant's only £1,000 for small uh, enterprises. The hospices have taken, I suppose, quite rightly the vast bulk of the funding, and I suppose we'd all be sympathetic towards that, but it leaves very little in the way of pickings for the other charities. And, um, I, I, I'm reluctant to criticise because I do honestly believe that both DFB and Department of Economy have gone the second mile to yeah. try and help as many as possible. I'm also disappointed to learn this morning that the average grant size for the hardship fund is £5,000. Now, um, 
that, that means they're actually going to be treated less favourably than the small business with a rateable income less than 15,000. So that is not going to offer a lot of hope to those organisations which have failed to get out of the 10,000 or the £25,000 grant. But equally, I'm not absolutely certain there's much more money left in the kitty to come up with additional funding. Hmm. Uh, did you say 890 million? 890 million, yes. No, because there's over 80,000. If you give every one of the self employed people in Northern Ireland £10,000 each, there's 80,000 of them, and that comes to 890 million. Thank you. Uh, just the, that's the, that's the business we're on with uh, due to the COVID. Um, I have put down here their sport for the sole traders. Uh, there are small businesses that, that seem to have really been left behind, and especially those on the 51,000, but we've rehearsed all of that there before. I just want to ask one question of us in the committee. Uh, just to make sure that when we say that the money should come from the June, I'm thinking the money should be coming from the June uh, monitoring, monitoring round and not the Cove money earmarked for other departments, i.e. probably I'm thinking of the Department for Infrastructure. Uh, and also, uh, I suppose on that, we should maybe ask the Minister uh, for uh, can he adjust the scoring for bids in the June monitoring round to make schemes that have dealt with COVID support a priority? Uh, Pat, just uh, when we were talking earlier on, we were talking about the Minister's wine to the debate that we agreed yeah. to. One of the questions we were going to ask about managing over commitments of financial allocations, because yes. obviously there isn't enough money to go around to be able right. to deliver this. So obviously the Minister very clearly made that he is looking at the June monitoring around, and that is probably the way he's going to look at the overcommitments of financial allocations. Yes. So I think because we've already agreed to write that to them, I think that could be encompassed within that, if we are content. No. Yeah. The, uh, but suppose I'm really looking at the statement yesterday and uh, that pot of money which was set aside for a particular department and that that's not going to be played on, that it will. But, I mean, if there is the understanding that that is coming from the June monitoring round, mm. and not for anything which is set at this moment uh, <laughs> that has been set aside for a particular department. Yeah. I am talking about, well, it doesn't really matter, department it shouldn't be from any department. That money was there, as made as a promise, it should still be available and be there. Yeah. I think, and again, and actually I think the Minister was very clear with us, is that there is overcommitment, but particularly when we look at supporting small businesses, particularly yeah. in the hospitality sector and the rest of it, with the rates relief out yeah. to the end of the financial year, that money is overcommitted. And I think the figure that the minister raised, I think, was around about 80 million, is potential sort of the degree of overcommitment. So that will have to be found within the sort of yeah. the monitoring round. Yeah, but also the chair again, uh, it's just to to look at all of the departments and those that have got money from COVID-19 and to look at the Department of Infrastructure, which doesn't at this moment, but I know that there is money held centrally for that. Mm. That's, that should be, I believe, on its way because that's the point I'm trying to raise here and we as the Finance Committee need to ask why and how. Yeah, I think you're great and I think we'll get the that when we ask those questions. Yes, chair, the wine. Just in reference to, to the wine there, where the Minister spoke about committee scrutiny, he said committees do have an important role to make sure departments are not sitting on money on the off chance that they might spend it and that they have a yeah. long, hard look at that. He yeah. then went on to say that is what we've been asking them to do, and I have to say that the response has been patchy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it might be worth considering next chair, week. I, we yeah. know and we've been told that the money is there, the money is held central. All right, so this is COVID money we're talking about. Well, that, that, that response that you come there from yourself would probably come, come via the June monitoring rounds. We're talking about money which is held centrally from COVID-19, which hasn't went to the department. Mm. And we need to ask why. This is critical. Yes. This is critical for the recovery. Mm -hmm. So I have always suggested and said that we needed a mop-up scheme for people who have fell out of the other schemes. Now, I'm not saying that every sole trader should get another grant. If, if a sole great trader has been able to get the self-employment scheme money and to help, then that's fine. 
But there are a certain amount of sole traders who, let's say, have started up business, who have spent maybe their savings on equipment and plant and stock, mm -hmm. who have never been able to open and sell. Uh, so there are unique situations whereby people, bed and breakfast, uh, husband and wife team, who pay domestic rates, hasn't been able to avail of any support. So there are unique place, unique businesses out there and people who have had no support whatsoever and who are deserving of support. And there should be, call it a mop-up scheme or whatever you want, but there has to be something there that will look down at every single night. That'll be time pressure, you know, this is massive. But they deserve support just as everyone else. Now, wrap it up as a mob-up scheme or as a recovery plan. Mm. Those people are probably, or chance, those are the people who are about to start up in business and sell things and make money. And they are the people who need to be supported in the recovery. So, so there needs to be more done in this regard. And I think, I think just to partially answer your question, I think it's something that the committee might be interested in. I mean, I raised the issue with the minister on several occasions. And I know it's not his fault he hasn't seen the economic plan yet, but I think the First Minister alluded to a fortnight ago that the economic plan was about to be presented to the executive to be signed off on. And of course, we haven't seen that yet. But again, that must be something that must be encompassing to be able to recovery plan for the business. And you're quite right about the idea of sort of a mop up fund. But I think what's more important is that first of all we get the readout from the June monitoring round. And bearing in mind, uh, and I reiterate what the statement from the Health Minister has been on more than one occasion, is there is very there is a potential for a second spike. Now, if there is a second spike in the rest of it, the additional costs come to health as well. I think that is significant. So it is something yeah, we do need to keep a, a careful eye on. There is the point about the budget. So at the minute, what we debated yesterday and what the Minister said, and that is a killer phrase which them just read out. So it is about, we know what departments have money-wise. But we haven't seen any evidence yet of saving plans or money that's not needed to be spent now. And let's cut away all the crap. Let's cut away all the nonsense. Uh, Unparliamentary language. Thank you. Let's cut away all the nonsense that, that we spend money on, and let's get it back into centre and then get it diverted into okay. Okay, get it diverted into supporting Thank people you. and supporting businesses in the way forward. Thank you. Um, Moving on to the next item on the agenda, Chairperson's business. There is no. Sir, sir, I, I've uh, suggested way forward there. Oh, have you, sir? Content to... uh, uh, members, are we content to go as suggested way forward in the clerk's paper? Great. 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 Thank you. Uh, chairperson's business. There's no chairperson's business. Moving on to correspondence. Um, page 79. Minister's response regarding to joint order for personal protection equipment. Uh, would anybody care to comment on that? Did you say response? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, there, I'm sorry who, would, who would like to start first? Oh. I, if that's okay, would you chair? Well, you know, I, I think this is. Like, I, I spoke in the chamber yesterday about the disdain that was being committed to the Justice Committee people uh, from the Justice Minister. I think this is equally distasteful and disdainful. Um, we asked for all email exchanges to do with this issue. The Minister says that the email exchanges between officials over the 30 and the 31st of March, there was a hole. Whenever we received all this evidence, there was a gap. First of all, of course, we're going to ask about the gap. So when we asked, was there any emails on the 30 and the 31st of March, the first question should have been, well, why weren't they sent in the first place? But he says here, the email exchanges between officials over the 30th and the 31st of March in connection with the order essentially related to volumes, products, specifications and pricing. Anybody that has read the emails that we have had sight of will know that every single one of those was about volumes, products, specifications and pricing. There is something rotten here. Something rotten. Now, I don't even know the content of those emails, but the fact that he has given that reason for not letting this committee see or have sight of those emails, and the fact that even with that explanation, poor as it is, he still hasn't furnished us with the emails. There is something badly wrong here. Now, I think, moving on as to the conversation we've had before, this is where these committees must show teeth. And I think we should compel 
if we go through those emails again and we see who actually wrote and wrote the emails, written the emails, we should compel those people, no matter what grade, to come to this committee and explain the content and the rationale for their wording and what happened on the 30 and the 31st of March. If the Minister and the Permanent Secretary and the Line Manager or the Grade 5 doesn't want to tell us or give us these emails, let's go down through the system and let's speak to the people who actually wrote the email. Now, the Department officials will be listening to me now. This isn't good enough. This cannot happen. We are a statutory committee and we should compel. We have asked for this information and it has been denied us. We then ask again, was there emails? And they now tell us, yes, there was. They don't give us any explanation, really, as to why they didn't give us in the first place, except for that daft reason. And then they still don't furnish us with the emails. It's diabolical. It can't happen. And I think this committee should look at the code of conduct for the minister. Because this is serious. It doesn't really matter what the content is anymore of those emails. It's the, it's the fact that he is deliberately withholding information and emails from this committee. That can't happen. I'll end it there. Any other comments? Totally support what Paul said. I think we should now be expressly demanding emails. I, think, I don't think it's for him to tell us whether he knows we need to see them or not. It's for us. As to the rest of that, I think it's a bit of a sham. It doesn't deal at all with the point about the forensic science and how that came to be transformed into uh, the supposed relevant PPE order. Just ducks all that. What is it? Chair, I think that you know only too well my uh, opinion on this is that uh, I think it's like running around uh, chasing our tail. Uh, and uh, that's exactly what is happening here. And that uh, we've had so many meetings, so many discussions, so much evidence presented in this whole issue that uh, I do think that uh, I would recommend to you, Chair, that you should just mark your letters red and that we move on from here. Okay, Matthew? Um, right, I feel slightly um, that this conversation has got stuck in a rut of, um, I, I don't. <laughs> of people um, seeking to uh, find a diabolical plot and other people seeking to avoid any scrutiny of the department at all. Um, as with most things in life, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Um, so to be honest, I don't think there's, a, I don't think there's evidence of a, a diabolical plot, but I think it's completely reasonable that the committee ask for information. And beyond that, I'm sort of bored talking about it. But, um, but I'm also dis dislike the, the principle that that we can't do scrutiny. So I suppose I'm uh, um, sort of betwixt and between here. But I, I do think it's reasonable for the committee to, to ask. Pat? Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, speaking as the chairman and speaking uh, again for the record, I find the fact that regardless of what's in the in emails or not, we did ask for all emails to come to this committee. Mm. And it is not up to the department to decide what are relevant emails or not. It should be to come to the committee, and we decide that. And if these emails are, in fact, just matters of procurement or matters of technical specification or whatever it is, that is up for us to decide. The fact that we right. asked for the emails to come to the committee, I think, is something that is absolutely fundamental to the role of the scrutiny of the committee, regardless of what is in the emails. Right, right. So, therefore, I, make, I would like a recommendation from this committee that we will write again to the department to furnish them all these emails with us forthwith, and I think we should do that. We should expedite that. Could I have a seconder for that? Absolutely. Um, I think we have to reinforce because this, this, this. I, I've, in my experience in the MLA, I have went through this time and again with regards to committees and departments, and I think this is the time we really have to use this as as, as, as an example. Uh, they have treated us with contempt, and, and I don't like it one bit. And I would like to clear this up by reading those emails and saying there's nothing to see here. But for us to say at this point there's nothing to see here, we would be advocating our role as scrutinisers. We haven't seen the emails. We haven't seen the emails. And, and the, the question is, why have you not sent us the emails? Why, why did you not send us the first time? Why did you not send them the second time when we asked? 
And why have you given us daft reason as to we wouldn't be interested? It's very boring stuff. That's not what we're here for. We're here to see everything. Okay. And I think we need to compel. I think we have to use that the language must be authoritative and assertive that we don't take this nonsense anymore because I've had years of it and I'm sick of it, to be honest with you. Okay. Are we content? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, move on to the next item, uh, equally uncontentious. Uh, the departmental response regarding the provision of relief to contracting bodies on existing contracts, including the cost of PPE and social distancing, page 81. Any comments? Take agreement to note. Uh, if we move on to the next item, the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs regarding the £25 million for farmers and horticulture, page 83. I would like to seek agreement to ask the Department for Finance to respond directly to the Clerk of the Committee for Agriculture, Environmental and Rural Affairs and copy the response to the Committee for Finance. Are we agreed? Uh, earlier on, I raised the issue uh, that was uh, raised by our Deputy Chairman uh, within the Assembly and also the issues particularly around the Justice Committee and the information the Justice Committee is getting. Uh, again, I would like to emphasise to all the committees that they should be getting all the information that they need from the departments, and particularly as we have just noted how vitally important it is going to be as we move towards the June monitoring round, that the committees are aware of what the pressures are, where the pressures lie, and if there has been an underspend that can go for what is the benefit for everybody in Northern Ireland. Um, can I seek your agreement to note the remaining items of correspondence? Agreed. Agreed. I would like to seek your agreement to note the information request to the Department and routine papers circulated on the 26th of May 2020. Are we agreed? Agreed. If we move to the Forward Work Programme, inform members of the updated Forward Work, work Programme is July 2020, is at page 95. I would like to inform members Mr Gareth Hetherington of the UUEPC has agreed to give oral evidence on the rating advice paper on the 1st of July 2020. I think that will be quite useful because we should have had the information from the June monitoring rounds so we can actually know if there's going to be significant pressures and whether we're going to be able to do this uh, relief as well. Uh, and are we members are we content with the forward work program? And I just had a question if I can bring it up again on the forward work program. Um, is the so the only oral evidence we're getting next week is from Felicity Houston about the about the functioning government bill? Uh, sorry, Chair, the um, uh, June monitoring should be in there as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that's uh, so it's okay. So next week is Felicity Houston and June monitoring. Yeah. And on um, on the functioning of the government bill, I think we discussed the Institute for Government. I don't know if we've corresponded with that. The yeah, I'm back from there. Uh, I think we have something back from them, but I think it's not committal at this stage. So. Right. Okay. I was just wondering because it was going to suggest we could also um, speak to the relatively likely staff, but uh, there's a, a think tank called Pivotal. There's no people. I think it's called Pivotal. Um, the new Northern Ireland think tank. Yeah. Who are sort of non-partisan and interested in public policy. I don't know if they have a locus on it. They might not have the. They have the, the expertise, but there might be an addition. And they're basically the first. I think sort of new indigenous Northern Ireland focused public policy think tank. Um, so it might just it occurred to me after the last time we discussed it they might have interesting evidence. Okay. It, it's it's worth us um Can we take we'll take um, Matthew we'll take that with the clerk and I'll like explore that and just see if they've got the capacity to do it. They may not. Yes. Okay. And we'll report back to the committee. Uh, members any other business? Anything further from NCA? Jim. Uh, yes, sir. I just happened to notice they came in in the middle of the meeting, so I haven't ah. looked at it in detail. But I think it's it's basically that yes, uh, they could facilitate a meeting, but with social distancing requirements, they couldn't accommodate any more than four members at a time. Well, maybe we could do it in Durham. But uh, I'll include that in papers for next week, and members can discuss. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, thank. You. Well, Lisa, that's fine. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, did the next meeting uh, half past two next Wednesday. Thank you very much indeed, Thank everybody. You. Thank you for that session. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.